right? It's not going to be like Star Trek where you're pulling stuff out of thin air because the thin air has molecules that also come off a periodic table and unless, you know, you can make you know, Beanie Babies and hot dogs out of oxygen and nitrogen, it's gonna be a really, really boring set of things you can print out of thin air, right? Because you can't violate the periodic table, right? This is why alchemy didn't work. You can't turn lead into gold. It does not work. You can't create a new element from another element unless you get at the very end of the periodic table where they're doing, um, you know, kind of uh, more radioactive sets of research. But if you're going to try to print yourself a new pair of jeans, you're going to need the actual materials that go in the jeans. So from a transport standpoint, the locations of production may change, the type of machinery that produces things will change, but you're still going to be transporting a lot of stuff. Maybe more commoditized, but it's still going to be a lot of transport. For construction, a good friend of mine is running a, a startup, they, they 3D print buildings but they also have a certain substance that's a chemical they've created, it's bio-friendly, and they print the building with that. Whether lumber's being shipped around or then you start producing this chemical en masse and you're transporting that around, 3D printing is not generally going to uh, disrupt it until you can pull molecules out of thin air, which seems to be a chemistry problem we probably won't get past. Hyperloop. Uh, so, I, I've been involved in some of these things, so uh, I'll, I'll talk uh, briefly about it. And a lot of folks think this is a really new idea and this is really hot. Uh, I was on a debate team in the early 90s, and one of the things that we debated was the future of energy and transportation one year, and a concept that was widely being discussed in the early 90s were these kinds of uh, mnemonic tube maglev kind of trains. So this idea has been around for 25 years. Uh, it is moving forward. It's gonna take time. Because if you wanna build it across large spanses, I mean, I'm sure, how, how many people here live in a highway where that highway's been on construction for what feels like forever, right? Right, so if, it, if that's true of a highway, even if you're putting it underground, it's going to be true of the Hyperloop. Will there be select areas? Sure. Is there more of a value for freight than people? Absolutely, right? There's an economic arbitrage of sending the materials more quickly. There's a financial benefit for freight. Will 15, 20 years from now this be a monstrously disruptive thing for transport? For sure. Is it going to happen in the next few years? Well, right now, Elon Musk is drilling, uh, you know, when he's not sleeping on the floor of his Tesla factory, he's drilling, uh, uh, you know, underneath uh, the city of LA, uh, the, you know, kind of the first test for the Hyperloop. But I would also note that there's already a subway under LA and many people from LA will tell you it doesn't exist, right? But it's already there and no one uses it. So this is important to keep in mind when we think about technology because, yeah, um, this someday this, this is an idea that could work, but the practicality of drilling through the ground, and look, don't get me wrong, the boring company idea, uh, you know, that makes sense, right? I almost bought a blowtorch, but I've only been married two years. I'd like to stay married a little longer, uh, you know, so I didn't get the blowtorch. But the point is, is that these things take time. And by the way, if there's any hiccups with Tesla, that will likely spill over into expectations for Hyperloop, right? If someone touches a technology and it doesn't work so well, uh, or there's, there's other kinds of problems with the business operations, that can have long-term implications that will push a technology out even further. So it will come maybe someday, but I don't think it will be imminently disruptive to this industry. And now let's talk about electric vehicles. A lot of folks are super excited about this unless they know the chemistry. Here's the trick, gang. We use about 100 million barrels of oil per day. That's 4.2 billion, billion gallons of oil per day. And that's not like equivalent. I'm not converting coal into barrels. I'm not converting that gas into barrels. I'm just saying oil. Out of the ground, jet clamp it, right? Like bubbling crude, 4.2 billion gallons a day. 
I would not consider that to be, generally speaking, a rare substance. However, something that might have the word rare in it, like rare earth minerals, that go into things like, I don't know, electric vehicle batteries, are probably quite rare. A news story out this week from Alpha Sites uh, that said that part of the reason Tesla is suspending its trucks is because the battery would cost 180 k which is the price of the truck. Moore's law does not apply to chemicals on the periodic table that are in limited supply on planet Earth. This includes the stuff that goes into the electric batteries. Yes, it might be cool if you live in LA to drive a Tesla, but one charge won't even get you to Vegas. Consider also Apple. Very recently, Apple secured mining rights to cobalt mines. Apple is worried about battery metals. Apple. Ever think about the size of a phone and a computer battery versus a car or a truck battery? There's a size difference, guys. Yeah. So three years ago, I started having conversations. Hedge funds started calling me because I cover metals and I cover commodities and I cover energy. And they figured out something that's not a big surprise. The demand for the metals that go in the batteries is going to rise. So if you secure some of those supplies in the supply chain or you buy them, you'll make a lot of money. There's not much of this stuff out there and there's really not enough to really change things over as quickly as people would think. As far as driverless cars versus electric vehicles, in September 2015, the World Economic Forum did a survey of its members. 79% expect 10% of all cars will be driverless by 2025. In contrast, the Energy Information Agency, which is the part of the US Department of Energy, expects through 2040, between one and 6% of new vehicles will be electric. Between one and 6% of the new cars sold every year. Now as we go to a commercial platform fleet and people figure out how to have a goober driving you around or whatever it's called and we resolve the issue that people are gross, I'm sure that one will be easy to fix. Uh, you know, once we get past all that, this percentage will probably go up, but that also means the cost will as well. And even though people bemoan $3 a gallon of gasoline right now or $80 oil, it's a lot cheaper than it was at its highest price point, and even at that price point, electric vehicles don't necessarily make financial sense for non-commercial purposes. But for this industry, it does, because unlike our cars, which I'm assuming, right, like I'm hoping all of our cars are sitting somewhere in a parking lot, unless anybody works for Waymo, and then your car is probably driving itself around. But generally speaking, hopefully, uh, <laughs> your car is, like mine, sitting in a driveway somewhere. Those cars have 5% utilization rates, but commercial vehicles have close to 100. And that financial difference will make all the difference in the world in terms of how quickly electric vehicles are adopted. Now, the last thing I want to share is a really, really, really big secret. In 2016, when I was working on my book, Jobs for Robots, I saw this picture. It's a poster. It's for an investment fund, it says, we believe mutual funds should be managed by humans, not robots. There's kind of a picture of the robot in a suit sort of thing. Now, I'm in Texas, this was in Texas. And I would ask you to think for a second, if you were to think, this is two years ago, if you were to think of places that would be really dialed into technology and FinTech, where would you think that would be in Texas? The people would know about robo-advisors, they would know about FinTech two years ago, that they would know what this stuff was. Where do you think? What do you think? Austin? Any other guesses? No? Dallas. Dallas? I know you guys are kidding. I know you know this was in the Amarillo Airport in 2016. My wife's from Amarillo. When you get off the plane, they smell what people locally call money. It's the cows. And if everyone there would have understood this and known what the implications of this are two years ago, 
I might want to think I'm up on technology. We might want to think we're up on technology. But chances are a lot more people know what's going on than you might even realize. And with that, I'll put up our standard disclaimer. I know you guys are speed readers. Uh, and the last thing I'll say is um, Craig Fuller contributed to a book we did in January called The Robot Automation Almanac. If you want a free copy, uh, we've made it free this week on Amazon. Uh, you can go to it, you can find the book, The Robot Automation Almanac on Amazon, or you can just go to robotalmanac.com and it will take you right to it. Uh, this was uh, actually a collection of 24, uh, 23 articles from different experts about what was going to happen this year in automation and robotics. And everything we've seen in the press in the last few weeks was in this book that came out in January. Uh, and like, like I said, we've made it free, so anybody who wants to download a Kindle version, you just go to Amazon, it's free to download. And uh, you know, I'm happy that Craig had participated and contributed to the book. And if you have any questions, you can shoot me an email. And with that, I thank you very much, and I appreciate being here today. Thank you very much. Welcome to this great update. My name is Kevin Hill, this is JT Ingstrom. And this is where we're going to talk about what's moving the freight markets in its earnings season. And Echo Global Logistics has reported. And here's what we know. It's five cents per share diluted. Adjusted one-time share, 26 cents. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the street was thinking 24%, 24 cent consistency on, on that. All revenue down about 8.8%. 8, 8 .8%. Truckload was down 11.2% and margins uh, restricted 70 basis points coming down to 16.9%, which is kind of in line with other, you know, C.H. Robinson, yeah. uh, you know, revenues down, the logistics departments of, of truckload carriers are about, you know, 10 to 15% down yep. uh, across the board, J.B. Hunt as well. So well, what do some of these numbers tell you about yeah. the market, J.T.? No, this is a really cool company uh, mm -hmm. with an awesome management team. Uh, who I've known for a while. Um, it's an interesting earnings release. You know, I think I think to start, uh, you talked about the EPS being five cents gap, 26 cents non-gap. Mm -hmm. Street consensus was 24 cents. And so with Echo, when they release, the question is always, what is street consensus in relation to? Yeah. And so my interpretation of this release was the 24 cents was non-gap adjusted EPS. Mm -hmm. So their release of 26 cents EPS uh, as a two cent beat, and that's the way I would have modeled it in previous, uh, you know, previous roles. Mm -hmm. uh, the reason why I, I say that and have confidence in it is because these non-gap adjustments uh, are are a holdover from pre previous acquisitions mm -hmm. which they had done, and they've had those non-gap adjustments for yeah. four to five years now. Command being one of those. Command right? being the largest yeah. one. There's some other tuck-ins, but Command's the biggest driver. Mm -hmm. So for any analyst who's not adjusting for that you've got to question their model a little bit. True. So in my view, it's a two cent beat relative to the 24 cent consensus. So with that said, you know, as you break down from top to bottom their income statement, you've got transactional managed trans revenue and within the transactional revenue, it's split between truckload and LTL. Prior to command, it was basically all LTL on the transactional mm -hmm. side of the house. They've now got a uh, more balanced split between LTL and truckload. Um, and as you pointed out, uh, you know, the surface transportation uh, market domestically is challenged mm -hmm. right now. So, uh, you know, it's all about providing market context as to how they're performing within relation to that. Yeah. And so I think I saw LTL volumes were down 2% year over year. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, I think that's right. And, and rates, rate per volume, I think, uh, was reasonable. We rates, had no... Yeah. Uh, I don't have it right in front of me. That's okay. But LTL rate per volume seemed to hold up reasonably mm -hmm. well, which is consistent with the fundamental dynamics in the LTL space. There's a consolidated amount of LTL brokers. There's also a you know relatively consolidated amount of LTL carriers. Mm -hmm. As a result, not only the asset-based economics a little bit more stable, so are the brokerage economics, yeah. uh, at least on a pricing perspective. Now. Truckload was a bit more challenged on volume. Was that right? Year over year volumes were challenged. Yeah, year year over year volumes were, were pretty flat. I think they were up one percent. Actually, so they were up one percent. Yeah, it was the rates so the, the, the rates that were challenging. And Doug said that volumes were up seven percent year over year in January. 
I believe so. So yeah. I would consider that a green shoot now. Mm -hmm. And they're uh, expecting 2020 to be much more balanced market than 2019 or even 2018. That's right. Where you're like, whenever, uh, around balance, around 50 more. And you know, what's interesting when you look at this picture uh, in total, so you look at the gross margin percentage that they drove uh, off these transactional revenues was 16.9%. Yes, yeah, 16. .9. Which was down 70 bips year over year. Um, which, given the market dynamics, in my view, is uh, a positive performance. Mm -hmm. Again, within the context of the market, um, so that those 70 bips year over year compression in gross margin percentage, given all of the headwinds in the domestic surface transportation brokerage space, and we've seen a lot of yeah. this this earnings season, with volumes relatively flat, mm -hmm. you know, after kind of rounding, if you will, sort of low single digits, plus or minus okay. zero. Um, that's a, a pretty reasonable performance yeah, we, on the transactional we, side of the business. We've seen um, gross margins contract from, from other public brokers that have already reported that or, or much, or say, in the hundreds, right. hundreds bips, right? right? So, you know, only a seven, 70 basis point move uh, contraction is a win. Yeah, I, and I, I, I mean, think. you know, if you start tightening up the truckload supply and demand dynamics, which will first and foremost benefit the irregular route truckload carriers, mm -hmm. secondarily benefit the spot focused mm -hmm. brokers who are benefiting from being able to drive gross margin on top of that spot yeah. with some lag, uh, then the asset based dedicated truckload carriers after the fact. Mm -hmm. You know, I think my view is that given, and we published our 2020 outlook. Yes, we did. Uh, very recently, which yes. if you haven't looked at, you should read, but it sort of outlines how we think that expectations are sort of uh, more rational for where the market currently sits mm -hmm. as opposed to where they were 12 months ago. Yeah. And as a result of that, we're much more constructive on what 2020 can hold. Not necessarily because it's a big bullish market, but, but because uh, people aren't expecting a straight line up into the right trajectory based off of a 2018 basis, which is kind of where we started 2018. It, it is. It's exactly where we started, we started um, last year. So. You know, I, I feel all right about this release from Echo. I think that uh, you know their 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 income statement has improved. Their balance sheet remains reasonable. They continue to buy back shares, compress the share count, which also helps drive EPS. And you're sort of getting towards the seventh, eighth, ninth inning of uh, a lot of these non-cash, non non, yeah. non gap adjustments. And so you have a much cleaner earnings release as well. And I think that will also have a from an equity trading point of view will have a significant improvement yeah. in the perspective and the sentiment of the stock. And that does it for this freight update. For all the earnings releases in the transportation industry, go to FreightWaves.com. Your supply chain can make or break your business. With Global Trans, you have the advantage of innovative logistics technology, expansive solutions and carrier network, and a partner committed to your success. Global Trans, freight driven by technology. Welcome to Off the Supply Chain, a show for shippers. If the supply chain is all about cooperative competition, so is our show. We're bringing you compelling perspectives from three market experts. Charles Dudley Warner is known for his famous remark, everybody complains about the weather, but nobody does anything about it. Well, today we're talking about what you could do about the weather when it disrupts your supply chain operations. Weather, otherwise known as an act of God, can wreak havoc on supply chains. This week we'll be debating topics such as how do you prepare for what can't be avoided? Are some weather events one-offs, or are they becoming trends as climates inevitably change? Now to our host, Chad Prevost. And joining us today on Weather Disruption, our three panelists, Zach Strickland, the Sultan of Sonar, the Director of Disaster. Welcome to the show, Nick Austin, Chief Meteorologist at Freight Waves, and City Councilman and Freight Wave CTO, Ken Smith. Great to have you guys on. Are you ready to play? Ready. 
Well, ready or not, here we come. The rules of the game. Each guest gets 40 seconds to respond with a 30 second follow up. We keep score and the winner is the supply chain champion of the week. Who will it be this week? When you hear this sound, you have 10 more seconds. When you have this sound, you're out of time. When you hear this sound, you get a point. When you hear this sound, you lose a point. According to the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, July 2019 was the hottest month on record. And this year is shaping up to be the third hottest ever with record low levels of sea ice and the continuation of an El Nino weather pattern, we could be seeing tremendous volatility this hurricane season. The response to the threat posed by Hurricane Dorian to the southeast coast of the U.S. has soaked up trucking capacity and affected spot rates to and from relevant freight markets. Meanwhile, 2019 has had its share of global and domestic headwinds, weather and otherwise. So guys, as callous as it may sound, is Dorian what the 2019 freight market needed to break out of a recession? Zach, let's start with you. No, no, it's not. Dorian wasn't near a significant enough storm to have that kind of impact on the freight market. Back when Harvey and Irma were hitting back in 2017, those were really tremendous storms. Hundreds of billions of dollars worth of damage. Dorian wrecked the Bahamas, total ca catastrophe down, down there, but it just didn't have the, uh, the damage capability that the other two storms had. So we really need something else to pick us up to pull us out of a freight recession. Okay, Nick Austin, what do you think? Well, I have to agree, if, if there was more damage in the U.S., it, it would have been a bigger boost, obviously. Um, the Bahamas are not a territory of the United States, uh, as the storms last year that, you know, the one that hit Puerto Rico, as Zach mentioned, was. So I would have to agree, if, if it had been a much bigger storm, a Cat 4, a Cat 5, a lot more damage, say like Michael did in Florida last year, it would have been a bigger difference. Okay, agreeing with Zach, another point for Zach. Okay, I mean, was there any damage in the U.S. at all? Ken Smith? Not enough, Chad, to, to really make that much of a significant impact in our economy. I mean, it's yeah, it, it definitely devastated the Bahamas, but when it comes to the United States, to what would really take it to pick up and make a significant impact in freight is going to be an ongoing, a long-term situation here in the United States where we're not just tying up um, freight for a short period of time, but it's actually going to be extensive and ongoing and uh, actually pulling either from the other coast as well, not just from the, the area around where it was affected. Okay, well, of course, we are entering into what they call hurricane se season. The uh, oceans are very hot. There's a prospect of a lot more of these happening. And also some are even arguing that we are not even in a freight recession anymore, that we've broken out of it. What do you say to that, Ken? I say I sure hope so, but you know, it depends on the indicators you look at. In some cases, yeah, it looks like, oh, we're definitely going into a recession. And then we, we find other indicators where the economy seems hot. So it's one of those things where it, it depends on, on which one of those factors you're, you're really uh, looking at and which one you're gonna give the most weight to as to whether we're breaking out or not. Okay, what do you think, Nick? I think we're definitely not done with hurricane season. Not just on the calendar, it doesn't actually end until November 30th. Um, but something that I do need to mention is that El Nino is actually over already. A lot of people don't realize that. We were in El Nino, but it's done. And El Nino actually suppresses hurricane activity overall. But because the El Nino is over now and certain other things are coming into play and we're right near the typical, you know, historical peak of the season, it's possible that we could see a, a landfalling hurricane in the United States that might be stronger. So what you're saying is there's Dorian. another good tragedy we're not going <laughs> to let go to waste. Is that what it's I'm hearing you say? It's possible, <laughs> yes. All right. Well, what do you think, Zach? Yeah, we're, we're at the peak of hurricane season about here in a week or so. And I think that that's, that leaves the back half of the hurricane season still left to go. There's so much more uh, volatility like available. Like we still have another full month of October. Some of the worst hurricanes in history have happened in October. The oceans are still super warm. Uh, there's plenty of time left. Uh, in terms of the freight recession, yeah, you could argue that it's, it's pretty much over already. We still have a lot of volume pushing through the system right now. So the demand side is there. It's looking stronger. Are you, are you seeing the volatility though because of hurricanes? Do you we're really not, think? We're not seeing the volatility year year. from the hurricane. But part of the question too was, are you just out, are we just out of the freight recession regardless of hurricanes? 
We, we have seen some signs that we are out of the freight recession in general and optimistic going into the fourth quarter because that's super retail heavy. Uh, the hurricanes also have big potential in October. Okay, that is fantastic stuff from our panelists. And after round number one, it is Zach with seven, Nick with four, and Ken with three. From spring into summer, the Farm Belt economy was devastated by the melting of record-setting snowfall and relentless rains. This caused the closure of railroads and highways, all dramatically limiting the amount of crops sent to market. Barges by the hundreds were tied up carrying corn and soybeans. At one point, almost 300 barges were held at two locks along the Mississippi. Estimates are three months of missed river traffic. With old crops in the way of new ones, it's yet another stress for farmers. What is the long-term impact of the extensive flooding of these waterways? Let's start with none other than Chief Meteorologist Nick Austin on this. Well, I think the long-term impact, when you have flooding that was that bad in the Midwest that lasted for that long, um, it's, not, it's not just the stuff that was planted early in the year, it's crops that were supposed to come up this fall, even trying to plant this fall for things to come up next. It's the long-term effects because the, the, the integrity of the soil is compromised when you have flooding that is that bad. And that's why it's gonna possibly have long-term effects on what can be planted in the future, possibly on, on prices too, uh, that, that, that we pay for our food at the supermarkets and at stores. What do you think, Ken Smith? So I think there are significant long-term effects. It's not just what we can plant later and the damage to the soil is, as Nick pointed out, but it's also the amount of capacity that we have out there on barges and everything else. It's, you're talking about perishables. So when they're sitting on those barges, is it all gonna go bad? And now we've just lost the capacity and we've lost the product as well. So you've got new product that you gotta get to market somehow. You don't have the capacity to get it there. So you got new product going bad while the old product's going bad, trying to get down where it needs to be delivered. So it's a long lasting impact on new crops being planted for the future, as well as current crops going bad. Zach? Yeah, so I, I, I don't think that it had any significant impact to capacity. I, I think really what it did was it just ruined a bunch of crops, wrecked the soil, as Nick <laughs> said, and now they're going to have another couple of growing seasons before they are able to get back to where they were before. Uh, this is not going to go away just over one season. We've got the winter coming up. That means they can't really do anything with that. And, you know, the, the supply chain disruption itself is going to have, you know, significant impacts moving into the future. They're going to have to figure out a way. The rails failed, essentially. You know, bridges were, th were threatened. They're going to have to redesign their supply chain to figure out how to avoid this in the future because flooding rains are going to continue to happen in the area. Well, that kind of answers my follow-up question, which is how does one respond to flooding of this kind? It's so extensive. Do you just hope for the best and, and deal with it as it comes? I mean, I think that's one of the big questions we're asking as we're talking about weather and disruption is how can you prepare for these acts of God? So you, you have to, I mean, you have to change where you source it. So instead of just sourcing it all in that one area, you're going to have to move maybe further north. Uh, you can hedge, you can do things like that to avoid some financial losses. But at the same time, like there's just no, there's no way you're going to be able to control the weather. And flooding on the Mississippi is not something new. It happens all the time. Uh, there's not any way you can get around that. So you're going to have to figure out a way to diversify your supplies. Yeah, absolutely. Nick, what do you think about that? What, how, what can we do to prepare for acts of God? I, I agree. As far as flooding, I mean, better levees? I have no idea. I mean, it's that, I mean, historic flooding like that, that kind of major flooding is, is difficult to really to, to, to prepare for and how to get ready for it was time. It? How, how, how often? Um, well, in, in, on some areas along the Mississippi River in Missouri, it, it, it was worse than the major floods back in 93. So, I mean, it was, it was equal or worse to, to that flooding in some spots. At, I'm not a farmer, but, at, but for just the farmers and the growers out there, I don't know how they can prepare. I mean, I don't think you can necessarily prepare crop or livestock to survive something like that. It's getting your property ready. What do you think, Ken Smith? Uh, is, it, is there nothing that we can do? Or is there something? Are we hedging? What are we doing? Well, you're, you've got to do something. I, I think nothing is definitely the wrong answer. Continuing to do what we've always done is what gets us in this situation every single time. And then we continue to ask the question, well, is there something we can do? You have to. You have to start looking at alternate modes to get your product. I don't know that you can source it from a different place necessarily, depending on what it is. 
if we're talking about produce, there's certain areas of the country that produce a certain type of produce in the volumes that you need. So you have to start looking at ways that you can get that to market or to your destination easier, better, and account for some of these cases when we have issues uh, like with, with the flooding. Okay, fantastic. After round two, Zach still maintaining his lead with 12, Nick with seven, and Ken on the comeback trail with 10. Logistics operations don't stop after a major storm passes. In fact, you could say that is when things get started. After Hurricane Maria devastated Puerto Rico in 2018, more than 10,000 containers of important supplies just sat at the San Juan ports. Only 20% of truck drivers had reported back to work after Maria, which made for a significant distribution backlog. Not only was there a lack of capacity, but many roads were impassable. Fast forward to today, after the deadly destruction in the Bahamas after Dorian, we could have a repeat of Puerto Rico. What are the logistics of dealing with the aftermath of a disaster? Let's start with Ken Smith this time. Thank you, Chad. So one of the things that we fail to discuss in a lot of these cases is what are we gonna do about just freight in general? You don't really take into account the infrastructure and what's required to get freight from A to B. It's, yeah, a river, yeah, that's infrastructure, but then what about the rest? What about your roads? What about your bridges? What about your sewers? What about things of that nature that we have to, as a city, as a state, as a country, we have to address those types of issues because it doesn't matter how good uh, you may have uh, your supply chain built out. It doesn't matter how many processes and how many uh, options you have to deliver goods. If you don't have good rails, good roads, open rivers, if you don't have those types of things in place and a way to respond to those uh, types of critical events, you're still gonna have a problem and people are gonna have that issue. So it's, and it's not something that companies, carriers, can solve themselves. They need to, of course, diversify on what they've got in their supply chain, but we're relying on governments to make sure that we've got the infrastructure in place to make sure we can get there. Wow, what do you think, Zach? Yeah, no, uh, when, the, when the natural disaster occurs, like the whole infrastructure is wrecked. So what people need to do is just make sure that they know they have disaster supplies on hand, everything ready to go, uh, because you can't rely on any of those things that Ken just talked about. You'd have the waterways are probably full of sewage. There's fires. If anybody, if anybody looked at uh, <laughs> Katrina damage, there were fires, there were floods everywhere. Uh, logistics of it involved trucks going to a staging area and they, they set up way outside of the disaster zones. So what that means is that they have to figure out a way to wait for everybody to clean out the, all the mess and assess the damage first before they're able to even get in there. So they really are at the mercy of the people that are going into the disaster areas and cleaning that up and making a way for them to come in. So all these supplies sit out on the outside of the perimeter in a safe area and they, you know, it may take days, weeks, months even for them to even get in there. Yes, as we have heard, has happened in, in numerous cases. Nick, what do you think? These are weeks because not just problems with sewage, all the other stuff, um, cleaning up <clears throat> down power lines. There are going to be live wires out there. And so that has to be taken care of. Trees down everywhere, just roads blocked. So before any freight or even release supplies can get in there, and there might be people in there that need to be rescued, which is why it's so important when people realize and when they know for days in advance that a major hurricane might be hitting their area, get out. <laughs> when they tell you to evacuate, do it because there's already gonna be enough work to do just cleaning up the area, but, and I, I, hate, to, I hate to sound mean, but, if, it, but if, they, if the crews have to spend time rescuing people who should not have been there, who could have left, that just adds to the problem. And it adds to more time you know, time that they could have been bringing relief in. So. You can hear the uh, the emotional appeal that Nick Sorry. is making. You've probably, I had to say it. you've probably I had to say it. told many people many times these things over the years. Uh, so I mean, and, and it, it begs the question: like, where you know, are the is the planning like that has to go in and the coordination, the coordination logistics wise for the aftermath of a disaster? Is there more to that than even preparing in advance, Nick? What do you think? I, well, I think there is just because of all the time it takes to to clean up the mess to begin with, as okay. we mentioned. You know, so, you know, um, I mean, I don't know. I don't really know if it's equal time cleaning up as to preparing beforehand because you do have to stage outside the areas. You have to get the release supplies ready 
and, and that could take at least a few days. What, what do you think, Zach? Yeah, there's, there's only so much you can do, especially when you have no idea. I mean, in days, advance or during? Days or in advance. Days, like, in advance. days in advance. Yeah. You see a storm coming, like with Dorian, for instance. It came in, they had it forecast going right over the center of Florida. It didn't go right over Florida. <laughs> so that costs a lot of money for people to divert supplies over to that area. And now once it turns north, literally a day later, they have to go and change where they're setting up all the supplies and they get ready for it that way. So, I mean, the cost going in front of it are significant. So they can't just simply say, well, we know exactly what's gonna happen this time, plan for it and move on. So perhaps the aftermath is a bigger deal. I don't know, what do you think, Ken? I mean, we're not talking days in advance. We're talking years in advance in order to have the communications in place to reach out to all the different facilities. And it's not just for supplies. It's for electrical trucks. It's for construction trucks that we see coming down from the north in droves to be ready ahead of time. You have to plan that out years in advance so that your communications are in place in order to be able to reach out those couple of days in advance and say, hey guys, this is it. Here's the drill, we worked on it. We need you getting down here. But then I think there's more time in those few days that we need to be worrying about how we're gonna keep those supplies fresh, how we're gonna have them ready to go because we have no idea the impact and how massive the storm may be. And after three rounds, we have Zach with 18, Nick with 12, and Ken with 19. A slight lead leading in to the lightning round where we're playing big deal, little deal. In the immediate aftermath of such events, supply chains play a critical role in disaster relief and emergency search and rescue operations. Big deal or little deal? Why or why not, Zach? Big deal, obviously. <laughs> There's, uh, I mean, the supply chain being set up appropriately means that they can get in faster with supplies, saving lives, making sure that everything is appropriately set up for the next people to come in. Saving uh, lives. Saving lives. That's a big deal. I mean, you can't argue with that. Uh, but also just or making sure you? that, you know, everything isn't disrupted anymore. I mean, the disruption to the natural disaster event itself causes disruption down the line. So in the middle of Florida, if all the infrastructure is broken, then people can't get to Miami, for instance. What do you think, Nick? It's obviously a big deal. If I said little deal, how would that make me look? Horrible person. But it wouldn't be an honest answer either. No, it's definitely a big deal. I mean, as, as, and, I, and that also depends on, on the level of destruction, of course, with the storm, whether it's a major hurricane, a, a lesser one. But anyway, you look at it, um, the supply chains are definitely important when it comes to any kind of disaster relief, okay, hurricane Ken. or otherwise. It's a big deal, Chad. And I mean, there's a lot of reasons. It's not just the supply chain and getting and getting relief down there, right? So we've got Coast Guard involved, we got military involved, we've got all these people involved that are down there doing the saving live part. We've got to make sure that as soon as the areas are cleared, as soon as we can get in, that those supply chains are ready to go. So of course, it's an absolute big deal. Again, we have to know years in advance how to prep, how to be ready so that two day phone call, everybody's immediately moving and not trying to figure out how to get there. And that's part of the supply chain plan. Brazilian farmers set fire to portions of the Amazon rainforest near their farms in early September. These fires were initially reported to be a result of climate change. However, like most fires that occur in the Amazon, they were man-made. Big deal or little deal, why or why not? Nick Austin. Well, I don't, I don't, maybe not a big deal to the entire world. I think there were some, some overzealous reporting of, of uh, some of the climate effects of the fires themselves because the Amazon, you know, it, is such a, a biodiverse area, but certainly to the local biodiversity and so that's a little the local then? ecosystem, it's a big deal. Okay. Globally, I don't think it's as huge a deal. Little deal then. Little deal, yeah. Oh, okay. Ken Smith. Chad, I'm going little deal on this one, and I know it doesn't okay. sound super popular to do it, and that's mainly because all we hear about is that the Amazon provides 20% of the oxygen for the world and nobody, you know, nobody wants that destruction. They're not thinking about the biodiversity, the indigenous people, yes. um, the farmers for that matter that have a right to make a living. We clear cut a lot in the United States, Chad, to have farms at some point in time and nobody said anything um, then. About a century and a half ago might be the reason why but, though, Zach. You're making it easy for me, big deal. <laughs> I mean, I get to save the planet and save the trees at the same time. It's a big deal because <laughs> They, they don't have the, the infrastructure in place in Brazil right now. They don't care that they're burning significant amount of acreage and they're not doing anything about it. Like for instance, in America, we started planting trees. We have associations that are there to replenish our forests. We're actually re 
replacing faster than we're cutting down in America. And they don't have that in Brazil. Wow, who well, knew? We now. <laughs> but we're not saving the planet. <laughs> I just did. <laughs> you, you did that. <laughs> For our final question in our lightning round, big deal or little deal? Freight Waves opens up free sonar access in the midst of Hurricane Dorian. Big deal or little deal? Why or why not? Ken Smith. I'm going with big deal, Chad. I mean, we, we just talked about how important it is for supply chains to be ready and be informed and to know where they can get, how they can get there. And all that information is what is provided by Sonar. I think it's a very big deal if people take advantage of it. Okay, Zach. Big deal, the most in, more information you have, the faster you can respond and more accurately. So efficiency on how you, how you appropriately act uh, to get those supplies in there. Sonar helps. Nick. For all those reasons, big deal. So why not open it up to folks right now who, who, who or at least at the time, didn't have access? so that they could get the information. Exactly, why not? Big, big deal. deal, big deal. Well, this has been a big deal and it's been quite the competition. Zach Strickland, 23, Nick Austin, 14, Ken Smith, 25. Congratulations, you Thank are, you, are our off the supply chain champion of the week. What are you gonna do with your week? I don't know, I think I'm gonna go back to work, Ken. <laughs> Quite the honor it is. <laughs> that is all for this week's episode of Off the Supply Chain. Join us next week as multimedia specialist Tim Dooner, market expert Zach Strickland, and associate editor John Paul Hampstead have a lively discussion about automation and how it's transforming the industry. Global Trends offers a full suite of solutions around logistics, supply chain, and transportation. Technology is what we do. Global Trends is bringing the trucking industry into the 21st century. From a small family-run business to now almost a billion dollar company, we did that all together as a team. And we're bringing the people, processes, and software together. When I joined the company three years ago, I was attracted to the high growth and fast paced environment, but I'm proud to say that we still have that nimble entrepreneurial spirit. As a leader in logistics technology, our platform allows us to serve any market, any mode, at any time. We're at the forefront of the logistics market. Our teams will always find a way to adapt to the best possible solution to service our customers. Our team is here for our customers literally 24 by 7 by 365 because we need to be and we'll get it done anytime anywhere uh, we have a very competitive team and that's that's what we really enjoy doing our mantra is simple we are the future of freight most big rigs in the u.s have tanks that range in capacity from 120 gallons per tank up to 150 gallons and depending on the radius of operation may have one tank for shorter hauls or two tanks for longer ones. For fleets that are weight conscious, they often choose to run just one tank, allowing for more payload since each tank of fuel weighs around a thousand pounds. Longer distance fleets tend to run two tanks, with the high capacity 150 gallon tanks offering the highest mileage range and best options to purchase fuel at the lowest possible retail price. At today's retail diesel prices, which are around $3 per gallon according to Sonar, a truck with one 120 gallon tank would cost around $360 to fill up and have a range of 600 miles. For longer haul trucks with two tanks, it would cost up to $900 to fill up with a range between 1,500 miles at six miles per gallon and as far as 2,000 miles for trucks that use the latest aerodynamic technology to reduce wind resistance, which routinely achieve eight miles per gallon. Good afternoon from the Air Cargo Conference in Nashville, Tennessee. My name is Scott Case. I'm the founder and chief storyteller of Position Global. We're here for a fireside chat with the team from Cargo Sprint. I'm very happy to have with me from my left to from my right, to, my left to my further left, actually, um, Rayo Torres, the COO of Cargo Sprint. I also have Chuck Manini, who is their director of information services, and Cargo Sprint's founder and CEO Joshua Wolf. Thanks for joining us, everybody. Thanks for having us, Absolutely. Uh, Scott and Freight Waves crew. Thank you. Um, so it was a lot of fun. Just right before this, we had a, had a session on airport congestion, 
where, Joshua, you were up there talking a little bit about some of the challenges that are faced at airports around the United States as we sort of modernize and try and find ways to deal with more air cargo in the same amount of space. Um, you and I actually <clears throat> share something in common in that we're both licensed customs brokers. Um, you relayed the story about, about how you got frustrated with, with the, the payment process. Um, and I was just kidding around with you before this that I went out and all I would do is I would scream and I would yell and I'd get angry and then I would just write a check and send it off and do it all over again. You, on the other hand, tried a different tact and, and sort of have us to where, we are, where we're here talking about this now today. Right, in, in 2012, uh, I saw a need out of my own personal frustration. Yeah. Um, so we had cargo stuck. I worked for a freight forwarder. A, a cargo was stuck at a cargo facility for a $65 import service fee. And uh, at the time, in 2012, checks were the only way. And some cases, they still are in, in some cities. And I said, there's gotta be a better way. So um, we put uh, check printers uh, in messengers' offices throughout the USA, and the uh, customer was able to pay online, and we printed a check at a, uh, a, a local messenger, messenger delivered the same day. We soon realized that's not the future, obviously. Checks aren't the future, and we, we, moved, uh, we, moved, we moved forward with other solutions. And, and the, the thing about that too, Rayo, is that the same way that you've moved forward with other solutions, developing technology is really iterative. I mean, we look at just how much faster our phones have gotten, how better our cameras and TVs have gotten. Has, has been developing what you've done with, with your platform had that same sort of iterative design where you, you have to sit down and say, what's the priority and then how do we determine what comes next? Yeah, uh, yeah we actually have our in-house uh, software lab uh, that was a priority for us, so we can continue evolving, and not only on the payment side of things, but we also created new solutions, and we are constantly like using new the newest technologies because uh, coding languages are are changing, right, and evolving. Mm -hmm. uh, and how do we prioritize? It's a natural; it's more organically uh, based on, on the demand and of the needs of the uh, our users. And, I mean, let's face it: you ask ten different people in a room what they want for lunch, you're going to get ten different answers, and I want to imagine the same happens then with users when you ask people for suggestions or solutions, a um, little bit of surveying, maybe something that wins. If, if you ask if, if something is in higher demand, maybe you prioritize that through the development cycle then. And, and uh, as Chuck Manini says all the time during our meetings, <laughs> and he has a very powerful phrase to me, he says boots on the ground. And by we don't do handshakes. Uh, director's level, you know, at corporate, where you don't see the operation and the pain of the users. Right. We have a lot of people, like our directors, <clears throat> go in cargo facilities and they experience firsthand the problems that truckers are, are facing, that the cargo facility is facing, and our customers, the trade holders, uh, they are facing. We listen, that's our research, we, we do our research, we see the, the problems firsthand and we create solutions for that. Working, the directors work, very, very close with the software development team, mm -hmm. and that's the beauty of that. That right. we, we are very close. There's not a long chain of, you know, command and, and scheduling a, a new feature for 2021. It happens people signing exactly. off. Exactly. <laughs> it happens like right away. That's the beauty of having your own uh, software team in house. Yeah. And you can deliver it, you can deliver it iteratively too and distribute it then out to everybody because having it centralized, one of the benefits obviously of today's modern day technologies, you can make the change on your side and then it just propagates down to all of your customers in all those different mm. places. Yeah, that's right. Uh, and, and you know, uh, yes, you, you said it right. And, and you use the phrase boots on the ground and, and Chuck, I'll turn to you. I mean, in your career as a trucker, you certainly saw, and, and I understood as a customs broker and a freight forwarder, that the trucker was really off on the tip of the whip. And if something went wrong, the person that felt it most acutely really was the trucker. Certainly the client didn't get their cargo or if there was a problem, but I mean, you were the one that were fielding the calls. You were the one that were between the rock and the hard place of the forwarder saying, I delivered that check, it's been paid, it's been released, and your person sitting there going, no it isn't, I'm across the counter, and they're telling me it mm. hasn't. Yeah, well, let me step back. I, I used sure. to be a truck driver, so. I know firsthand, you know, let's go back 10 years ago when Camelot would give us a pickup order right. as a company to pick up cargo, mm -hmm. you know, their obligation was to create a flight folder and make sure that there was a pickup order in the flight folder and we had a 3461 custom clearance attached to a pickup order and the freight forwarder would check with the airlines to make sure the freight was broken down, it was paid, it was available before they dispatched the trucker. Well, today, you know, this, this 
the documents are moving a lot faster than the cargo is. So what happened out of uh, habit, and we created this airport congestion, is we're just sending truckers over to the airlines and the freight facilities and telling them, just go check to see if it's ready, you know, because they're moving the files a lot faster than they are cargo. So that's our problem with the airport congestion, and we really have a solution. And really, when Ryo said we're boots on the ground, we go right on site and we understand the facility's needs, and we work with the front counter, the warehouse, and the managers, and um, work with, with them, like boots on the ground. So, so when you enter a market and you're, you're going to work, and, and your clients are primarily the ground handlers, obviously, or the airlines directly, depending upon the market in which you're in and, and the type of customer it is, mm -hmm. Who embraces the solution and who do you sometimes need to just either explain it or give a little bit of encouragement and, and nudging to really kind of get there? Because obviously, if somebody is committed to say, hey, listen, we want to find a solution to this problem that we know that we have here at our dock, um, they're on board. But maybe the people that are, that are using them directly or indirectly need a little bit of arm twisting. Well, what we do is when we go to a facility, I'll go on site or we'll go on site and we'll say, hey, you know, be tenure hire me as an employee, as I'm working the front counter, as I'm working the warehouse, as I am a truck driver coming in your building. So we understand the freight flow and, and all of your operation before we come on site and give you a, a whole solution. This is what you need to do. We understand all the pain points and then we start working as a team. We have meetings, okay, for this facility, this is what we're gonna do. We're gonna put you know, this, this computer here, we're gonna work with the warehouse on this side. So we work really close with the frontline people to understand you know, how this process is gonna work. When you're, when you're in a market and you're doing these types of things, what are, what are some of the commonalities you see within the facilities? So obviously a lot, of, a lot of markets have regional truckers, particularly as you look at some of the larger gateway cities and, and whether they be a regional operator, whether they be a nationwide operator that sort of has that footprint. Do you need to sort of adjust that culture based on the truckers or the forwarders or the type of traffic that's coming through that facility, would you say? No, the, the common problem that happens is a trucker will show up with five pickup orders, okay, in their hand, five different master airway bills, maybe 10, 15 different house bills, and they'll go to the front counter and say, hey, I want to pick up this cargo. Right. Well, for every master bill and every house bill, it takes about seven minutes to process and look through all the computers and make sure that freight is released, it's been paid, it's broken down. So can you imagine if they come in with five, but only one shipment's ready? So you've wasted all that time for that driver to sit in the front counter yeah. for freight that's not available. Mm -hmm. That's the issue we're having, and, and every facility has that same issue. And, and to bring it back, or to bring it around to a topic that's been, that's been hot the last couple of days, Josh, I'll take it to you, um, just sort of the environmental piece of this thing. I mean, there's, there's been the discussions for the ESGs and how this does. As you talk about those seven minutes and mm -hmm. the pileups, you're doing work out on the West Coast, they're a lot more sensitive to, say, operating trucks, emissions, there's idling rules out there. So do your customers also look at this and say, hey, listen, this is, this is helping sort of our employee work place it's it's better environmentally because we're turning people better I mean is there is there a benefit to is there a benefit to this as well for for the greater planet do you think certainly I mean if you've got less trucks waiting in one area less trucks less, less trucks uh, idling then yes you're you know there's a benefit to uh, uh, that that certainly hasn't been a, a big key point but I think more emphasis should be put on it um, uh, but but yes I mean that's that's the goal less congestion get the trucks in and out. If they're spending less time, less time on, the, uh, on the airport, then they're, 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 then they're using less fuel, right? So, A question for you, Ryle. Is this scalable? I mean, so if you, if you look at places where there's a little bit of a congestion problem and somebody's just trying to optimize and be better with their process versus someone who's really looking at a serious traffic problem that's impeding their flow and their ability to get work done within their building, can you say, we've got this here and regardless of how big or how small it is, you're able to adjust and, and it just, I mean, the, the, the solution adjusts based on, the, based on the amount of volume that it needs to address. Yeah, of course, uh, we, we've been, I, I work very close with our software engineers and they call it like having a box of Legos. So you have different features. One feature might not work <clears> for a, a facility and another feature will work for other, other facilities. So the beauty of, of our own uh, box of Legos is that you can turn some features on and do we do we do 
customization, like based on this research in each facility at, at the airport level, at, at whatever level we, you want to call it, but it's, it's research and say, okay, we have these tools, this might not work for you, this will work for you, but it's... Uh, but everything is in there, and if it's not in there, it's a new feature or something different that we don't have, we develop it. Chuck, is congestion a bi-directional problem? Like, we think about the tremendous amount of flood of imports that come in and the amount of time that it takes to break it down, the regulatory component of getting CBPs released, making sure that the charges that are due are coming in, the solutions for, for the technology that we're looking to do to reduce congestion. Is there a role to be played for helping reduce congestion for export cargo as well, or, or domestic, which affects a lot of the people here at this conference? Well, it's a good question. The way I look at export, if you go on our system and book a shipment for export, this helps the warehouse because a lot of times they're building up ULDs and they're waiting for this last piece of cargo to show up at the facility so they can finish building that ULD. Well, sometimes they have to stop building it because they got a booking that's saying, hey, I'm gonna drop, drop off this 3,000 kilo piece, here's your dimmed, so they need that last piece. So can you imagine the efficiency your your warehouse can have now by booking export shipments and they'll know that, hey, Cunanago or Shankers, they're, they're gonna drop off this freight with this trucker at this time. So now they have true picture of how to build an export flight and in the time efficiency. It's kind of funny, there's a, I, I like to, there's a great Dilbert cartoon where the, where the last frame of the Dilbert cartoon is, is the pointy haired boss looking at Dilbert and going, from now on I want advance notice of any unplanned outages. And, and a lot of times that, that's sort of what is happening. I mean, as, <clears throat> as, as we're pushing to sort of automate this process, the more visibility, the more information, it's, it's decision making. It's like if you walk into a hospital and you go, I'm sick, they're not just gonna, they're not just gonna open you up on a table and give you open heart surgery. They're going to run some diagnostics and find out what it is to make that decision. And I think the information that we're now able to start to generate as an industry is, is really what's gonna, what, what's gonna make a difference here. Um, Josh, I wanted to, I mean, we, you fly enough. I mean, we all fly enough doing this thing for a living. I mean, we all remember the days of paper tickets. Heaven forbid you lost that, that paper airline mm. ticket. I mean, you were clinging to that for dear life and now, there are no more paper tickets. I mean, for people who've been to, to CNS, which is the, the North American IATA headquarters, enshrined on the desk in, the, in their lobby in Miami is the last paper ticket that was ever issued. And it's amazing to think about how we were able to get rid of paper for passengers mm -hmm. a lot faster mm -hmm. than we got rid of paper for cargo or made this a lot more efficient for cargo. How have you, sort of, how have you seen the advent of technology, the advent of what, what this industry is starting to do, um, catching up really rapidly from behind. Um, and do you feel like it's moving faster and faster to get to these solutions that people need? There's still a ton of paper. Um, you know, on the export side, we've got TSA regulations and, and there's questions, does this government entity need original or not? And we don't really know the answers. There's a, there's, a, there's a ton of paper. On the import side, you've got original delivery orders and you've got warehouse release forms and you've got authority to make entries and some markets have unique forms and some don't, you know? And in Los Angeles, you've got an authority to make entry forms. And, so, and some export countries where you need to have an original airway bill still despite mm -hmm. the press and the move drastically to try and move to e-airway bill as, as an industry, right. well, I think, to get rid of that paper. I, but I it's think one we're almost there because you know, as I go and see all these different facilities, you know, at all these different airports, you can see cubby holes of all these documents mm -hmm. that are sitting in there waiting for the freight forwarders to pick it up. So that's kind of telling me that they really don't need these documents as much as everybody assumes we need a document to clear cargo nowadays. So that that's getting away because they're just <laughs> staying there for 15 days yeah. and then they cost them. It was, like looking, it was like looking at the cubbies at customs yeah. when just right. every customs broker had a cubby hole so that as the customs officers worked the entry, it went back out into that broker, or back into right, that messenger's right. cubby. And that was great when those are the brokers in that city that were filing those entries. But now, courtesy of RLF, there's paperwork at, that has just been reduced to an electronic transaction mm. that never crosses a counter, that never manifests itself on someone's desk, but is only there on a screen. Right, we don't have to get rid of all the paper all at once. It's one step at a time, taking a look at every single process individually and saying, you know what? Why are we really using this particular form here? Why is this warehouse using that form and this one, this one? It's one step at a time. So we are you know, talking about those boxes. If you look at the number of paper, it's, it's, it is shrinking. Yeah, that's good. No, it's, it's fun stuff. Um, so Josh, it, it's, it's a silly question, but can this be fun to do? 
And, and I say fun in the sense that some people, some people like Apple, some people like Samsung, some people like Android, some people like iOS. Mm-hmm. But, but the fact is that as, as we look to people to adopt this technology, it's got to be something that's easy to use. It's got to be mm-hmm. something that's intuitive. It's got to be something that makes sense. There's joy in data. I mean, certainly data visualization is something as well that's taking off as people present to show mm. the trends and identify this. Do you, do you think that, that this is something that should be pleasant and easy to use, or is it just, I mean, do we just have to deliver a solution, user <laughs> right. experience be darned? Well, everybody's idea of fun is different. So from a personal experience, I mean, fun for me is, is making a change, right? One of my most exciting moments in this industry was I was outside in Los Angeles, and I was walking outside a cargo industry and there was a really long line. And uh, a driver rolled down his window and said to me, hey, they need your solution over here. They need Sprint Pass over here. And to me, that was fun, right? That, that is fun. Actually being on the ground, fun for me is not actually running a company, okay? Yeah. Fun for me is making changes, being on the ground, listening to truckers and solving problems, right? I, I you know. I'm an entrepreneur, that's where it comes. I can tell you for me, fun is, is seeing the employee's face, the front line, front counter person, right. when they used to be able to take a piece of paper and hand write the master bill and reject a shipment, okay? Here's the master bill, here's the house bill, here's my name, here's the, today they click in our system and boom, it prints up a PDF. And when you see their face saying, wow, I wish I had this long time ago. Yeah. That's fun for me, seeing the employee's face and what difference we make in their lives by just one click and they have a PDF with a rejection form. That's fun for me. And, and, it's, unre- and it's unrelated to sort of what we're talking about from a congestion point of view, but one of the things that came up was, was keeping and retaining people. That was one of the sessions that we, that we had late in the day on yesterday, what had late in the day yesterday. Does bringing this sort of technology and just bringing these solutions to airports, do you think it helps the retention and, and sort of keep the, mm. keeps the cycling to a minimum? Because a lot of times we see people just come and go in this industry, whether it be from the counter side or from the trucking side, because they get burned out. They get burned out with the way that they're treated. Does, do you think that, that indirectly the solutions that are now making themselves apparent, do you think that helps retention for the industry? I think it does. No one wants to deal with an angry trucker, right? You don't, you don't want to be a front counter agent and, and have somebody angry that they've been waiting two hours, right? No, it's right. not going to make your job fun. So, so, you know, we are, and we're actually creating new positions. You know, if you bring efficiency to the front counter, that front counter agent could be working, you know, in the back office, uh, scheduling pickups and reviewing documents and paperwork and data ahead of time, right? Not before. So we're, we're, we're creating new roles, we're moving those roles, and we're reducing stress, so so that that in turn makes things fun. And, and I see in our world, in our industry, it's complex. It, it's hard to teach someone brand new off the street what import and export is and what the definition of everything. So with what we have in mind with our software, it's click, click, click. So the uh, process of training someone is very easy. So when people start realizing that software is easy, they're gonna stay with the company. When you have a software that's you know, complicated and you have to remember this code and that code to do this, to get done with the end of your day, people get frustrated. And they said, this has gotta be a better job. Yeah. So that's what we've done is some studies on you know, the software being so easy to use. No, and, and that, that is certainly something that you're right about. I mean, the, the, mm. the key thing I think that, that we need to take away as an industry and, and the solution that you're bringing in, and there was a lot of thoughtful things that came out in the panel, uh, in the panel discussion that, that you participated in earlier, is that, is that there is a need for this. And I think that as we've seen the, the technology changing and evolving, people who had sort of older siloed systems that maybe didn't talk with one another or didn't have the connectivity that some of the newer programming languages have, those APIs, that data sharing is gonna, is gonna be a lot better because that data is gonna be the king. You're gonna, your customers use that to show how successful things are. And, and conversely, you're, the people who are going in there as well that are, that are participants and users in these systems can see how things go as well.
listening to Why the Truck. It's Monday. Monday. <laughs> it's Monday. Yeah. Hey, so over the weekend, the XFL relaunched to uh, quite a bit of fanfare. Very, uh, very nice reception online for it, on Twitter especially. What did you think? Didn't you think it was great? It's a good-looking product. All those, There's a lot of players out there just because they can't be one of the 1,500 that are in the NFL. I thought, yeah, I, I really liked it. I thought uh, P.J. Walker, he's dynamite. He's a star. I think that I'm a Houston Knicks fan now. You're going for the, the, the I'm a Knicks. Knicks. Yeah. yeah. The, who, well, I feel like the, clo- the closest team to us is, is Tampa Bay. <laughs> yeah. Oh, the Vipers? Yeah. Yeah, I'm not taking the Vipers. I know, it's hard. Know what I know what I do like though? I like that they can use it as sort of an idea incubator and um yeah. They do. The, the the USFL though, man. Do you remember the USFL? That I don't. Was that was good. That was a little before my time, but I know like they had like John Elway and stuff. But it was yeah. in the early eighties, right? Kelly. They had like R- like Herschel Walker. Like I was like, this is gonna be the third branch, and it started to happen. Yeah. And then something happened. Now, I'm not saying this, but there's a documentary on ESPN that says this, that says that Donald Trump is the one who ruined the USFL. Have you seen that one, the 30 for 30 on the USFL? No. Yeah, they heavily implied that he was the one who screwed it up. But I'm not saying he did. I thought he just wanted to buy the Patriots and couldn't. Speaking of, have, so yeah. t- speaking of things that got screwed up, did you play Mono- McDonald's Monopoly when you were uh, yeah. years ago? It hasn't yeah. been around in a while, it right? It was really fun back in the day. Back in the day, did you yeah. ever win? Back back in the day, where the the parents took took you to McDonald's all the time, and you didn't they but, didn't think anything of it. Did you win anything yeah, more I, than a French fry? No, I kind of just won French yeah. fries. Yeah, well, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> there's a reason why. There's a documentary, right? Oh. on HBO called McMillions. It's a docu series. I think the first episode is out now. I watched it, and it's almost like the, every great documentary is almost not even the story. It's the, the characters, the people involved. And in this one, it almost seems like a David Guest mockumentary, like the FBI agent who went undercover is hilarious. But it turns out like this marketing firm, they were gaming the system, the security guy. The head of security for this marketing firm was yeah. was uh, giving people he knew the winning tickets, and then they would split the, the profits, I think. I don't know. The first episode ends where they identify who was actually doing the caper, but the funniest part from the show is they're they the guy who wins. They want to set him up, so they want to record it. So they do like the publisher's clearinghouse thing, where they go to his hay, his house and they videotape him with like the big check. Right. <laughs> well, they took him to the beach with his big check because for some reason, part of this guy's story is that he had a People magazine and it fell in the beach, like the water at the beach, and then he went to the grocery store and he bought another People magazine, and that somehow had a McDonald's winning ticket in it. I guess you in People magazine. You could get the peel-off tickets. Wow, there's a lot of subplots. Well, he so he has the big check on the beach though, and then some drunk guy runs by and steals the check and just starts running away with it. But it's just like it's paper check. But it, wow. I guess you know it's the funny money was worth some, something to somebody. Oh, and by the yeah. way, thank you to you guys. Our 150th episode was our most downloaded episode of all time, and by a long shot, it did really well. I appreciate everyone who uh, who listened and shared. And it was put your that great one out headline. There. Could have been, could have been, um, and it could have been our great sponsor. This episode is brought to you by Redwood Logistics, a leading logistics platform company whose diverse solutions portfolio includes digital freight brokerage, flexible freight management, and innovative platform services that simplify the integration of disparate supply chain technology. Redwood connects its diverse roster of customers to the power of supply chain management technology and the industry's brightest minds i for love more, it when a plan comes together for more information tell them chad redwoodlogistics.com whoa uppercut uppercut body, body blow. blow all right oh look at this one 90 surprise 90 percent of drivers <laughs> seeking jobs have failed to register in the drug and alcohol clearinghouse who could have seen that one coming despite call Despite calls urging truck drivers to register in the FMCSA's drug and alcohol clearinghouse database, over 90% of these drivers applying for jobs have not done so, said Jeremy Reamer, founder and CEO of Driver Reach, a recruiting and compliance management company. Reamer told attendees at the Cat Sapper and Miller 2020 Trucking Owners and Leadership Roundtable. Wow. Uh, February 4th in Indianapolis that more than 3,000 failed drug and alcohol test results have been recorded in the database in the first 30 days of operation since it went live on January 6th. And that's pretty and impressive because the first week you couldn't even access it. Right. And then it's only representing apparently about 10% of the drivers. That, that's a lot of failures. Too. So, yeah. Uh, I mean, if you would that be 30,000? I don't know how many would be in there if everyone actually did it. I don't know. But he said that it's good news because now we're aware of them, these drivers, and Previously, they were going undetected. While drivers are not required to register, carriers can be put in a tough spot 
when they are not allowed to pressure drivers to register, but without drivers registering and providing consent, carriers may not be able to meet legal requirements. Raymer noted that a carrier must do a, quote, limited query of its drivers in the database at least once a year. Hmm. A limited query will only tell the driver, the carrier, that a driver has something in their file. To get the full results, a full query must be conducted, and that requires the driver's consent. That's like a dating site where, like, you can just see kind of, like, the town they're in. I don't know. Or, like, the state, <laughs> you know? like it, I don't Right. Know. This is a limited query, right? I know. What, what is going on? Like, why don't you just get the information up front? And I guess you have to pay. It's about it's transaction it's rights, too. you know? Well, the flip side is that even though drivers are not required to register, there's the catch-22. Carriers are unable to hire one until they provide full consent for a query, which can only be accomplished by registering. So you're not required to, but if you don't, it you can't get hired. circuitous. Yes. Registering is not, but it's probably maybe regulatory easier to do it that way. I don't know. Registering is not a simple task, Raymer added. But for a carrier's perspective, there's a, is, there's a big benefit in terms of compliance and having drivers register for fleets. He said here, at the very least, you are going to have to run a limited query at least once a year. The cost of not being compliant is significant. It is not more than $2,500 per incident. But if you're a thousand truck fleet, that could be $2.5 million in penalties. So yeah. go and register. What's millions among friends, though? Uh, okay, and now we have um, the this, this sad news about some of the things that are happening in the industry. Yeah, JP touched on that, remember? He, yeah. uh, we got some more details, though. Yep, uh, Coyote Cuts, the Chattanooga brokerage floor, and the Chicago IT staff. Yeah, on Friday, uh, Coyote Logistics, a wholly owned subsidiary of UPS, laid off all of the carrier representatives in its Chattanooga office, leaving a small group of salespeople and administrative workers. Coyote had let the office shrink by attrition over the past year, not hiring replacements for brokers who left, but... Yesterday, about 25 people in Chattanooga lost their jobs. 30 IT workers were also cut from Coyote's Chicago headquarters. In one sense, it's the end of an era for freight brokerage in Chattanooga. The layoffs at Coyote have come at a time in widespread reductions in headcounts across transportation and logistics industry. Um, but the former Coyote brokers in Chattanooga, they're likely to found, find jobs. Some did on Friday. They Covenant had like a luncheon for them, and they already got jobs over there. I know that uh, Dave Abels at Dart reached out. Uh, the Guide One group, Trident Transport, Arrive Logistics have all provided homes yeah. to these brokers. So pretty cool. They have a really interesting story, too. There's there's other options, yeah. Uh, I, I remember, remember this. Um, yeah, UP, well, in 2015, UPS acquired Coyote Logistics for $1.8 billion, and that was after the, uh, Coyote had acquired Access America here yeah. in Chattanooga. Uh, uh, since then, Coyote has doubled in size with an estimated 2019 revenue of $4 billion. In the past two years, though, UPS's corporate management has made a series of changes to the brokerage, including reducing incentive-based compensation removing carrier reps' visibility into their margins per load and aggressively enforcing non-compete clauses, even against non-revenue-generating employees like carrier reps, and we talked about in last yeah. episode, in an attempt to reduce churn and control costs. Yeah, when I was at FedEx Trade Network's Tower Group, was, it was Tower Group before people at Tower were always afraid that too much FedEx was going to infiltrate their old culture because of things like that where, you know, the big corporate parent comes in and then you're just a name on a spreadsheet and then you're just, you're just crossed out. You know, but yeah. here's the good news. Logistics job growth is still surging. Although we've read all about these layoffs, job growth is outnumbering any attrition, especially in the warehouse and delivery space where jobs are tethered to e-commerce. Right. Courier and mess messenger payrolls grew by 14,300 last month, extending an 11 month hiring spree, according to seasonally adjusted preliminary employment figures that the uh, U.S. Bureau of Labor Statistics released on Friday and is reported by the Wall Street Journal Logistics Report. Yeah, love that report. It's a section we actually sponsor. The job growth by UPS and FedEx is being fueled by weekend delivery demand as customers are being offered accelerated service like one-day delivery that we all know about and Amazon and other online retailers yeah. have to extend delivery to Saturday and Sunday. Yeah, it's going up because you got to work every day. U.S. employees, employers, they added nearly a quarter million jobs in January. Yeah, not bad, not bad. We always hear these, like, recession fears, but hiring is still up, and um, payroll is up by 3.1%, too, so people are getting a nice bump in salary, or at least a little bit of a bump in salary. Yeah. Uh, 3,200 of these jobs were with trucking companies, construction, and education, so the highest levels of growth. Well, the auto, auto industry, which has been a 
you know, they've a lot of trouble over there. They've declined in over 10,000 jobs. Not, not really a surprise there. Was no. A 12% decline in heavy-duty truck sales didn't help out there, though, at all. No, not at all, not at all. But still good news on that hiring front. Now we are going to call Jamin Alvarez. Jamin! I'm excited. He's a, he's a he's a big supporter of Freight Waves on the LinkedIn. We're going to do uh, five good minutes with him. Five, count of five. Five good minutes. Hopefully our luck is better than... um. Than it has been. He's a two-ring kind of guy. So Jamin over here, he is uh, three ringy dingy. Yeah, he's three uh, ringy dingy. He uh, is what's it called? He lives in Newport Beach, California. He has three very southern tips for winning freight. We'll get to all of that with him, hopefully, if he answers. But maybe not. Maybe. So he's a sales guy, and this can happen in sales sometimes. Maybe, just maybe. He. he uh, Hello? Please leave your message. Oh, he's man. on California nine, time. Four, he's nine, on California nine, time. Nine, yeah, literally. Nine, Who three, says California nine, people are flaky? Six, six, oh, seven, maybe wait, he's calling. I think he's oh, on the wait, other end. There's hey, more. sir, how's it going? Jamie, what's up, dude? Hello? What's your sound? Maybe you're uh, the phone. Oh, now I got to, right oh, there. see, now I got to reconnect it. Hey. Jamie. Hello, hello. Hey, hey, what's up, man? We thought you were big time in us. We got, you your, uh, we got your voicemail. <laughs> so we're, we're just oh, going to leave you a message. yeah. How is it out just there? It's a on... real power move. <laughs> <laughs> How is it on uh, California time out there? Hey, I, I can't complain. Uh, I'm here in uh, Fontana right now at the foothills of, of the mountains, and it's pretty windy, but uh, sun as always. So I'm going to I'm gonna be that California guy and brag about the sun. <laughs> yeah, well, nice, we've well, had it's... 60 days of rain here. We even <laughs> had snow over the weekend. Thanks for rubbing it in, man. <laughs> in Chattanooga, we get everything but sun. Oh, boy. Least... Although, you know what? In the snow, afternoon. It's still a great, though. In the afternoon, it did yeah. get nice and sunny, so we, we will take that. You are, uh, so tell us a little bit about yourself, Mr. Alvarez. You are, I think you recently started as director of sales at RDS Logistics. They do some intermodal, dedicated 3PL services, that kind of stuff. Yeah, so I, I came over there, a longtime asset player in the uh, L.A. Basin, and I came over to both suck up all the knowledge I could about the asset side. That's new to me. I have a 3PL background, and then help them build a uh, another division uh, to take advantage of all the fun stuff that having a uh, brokerage arm can, can do. So uh, that's what I'm working on right now and having a good time learning and, and uh, building up the team and, and all that good stuff. So um, it's a, it's a fun, a fun time in, in our industry, as you guys know. Um, so I'm really just trying to go all in on uh, I think how freight brokerage is, is going. It's really adapting. So I'm, Oh, that's what Simon says. Adapt and thrive Adapting. with Jamin. Yeah. yeah. I noticed, yeah, there you go. Right. On your uh, LinkedIn, I noticed that you you say you're aiming to show your true personality, flaws, and talents. It's very authentic of you. And, uh, and, and Heavy you, on the flaws. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and you like to partner with people and not just, like, work for. And uh, Yeah. I, I, I'm, I'm seeing a lot of, uh, you know, I think – for the first time, and a lot of me, I've been doing this 14 years. I feel like the adults in the room uh, may not have the answer. I'm certainly not one of the adults in the room, nor do I profess to have the answer. But I think if the more we can all work together, uh, it was, I know you guys were talking about Coyote earlier. Uh, definitely a sad news, but a, a positive was just seeing how the, we'll call it the 3PL community came together and mobilized really quickly to to engage, uh, either offer jobs or even just encouragement. That's to me more where, where we're going a little less adversarial as three PLs and, and, uh, kind of more coming together and hive minding, uh, the problems that, that might come our way. This is, this is very much your, your winning personality over here. You have an article on your site and like you may be over in Southern California, but you have three very Southern United States tips for winning freight, and they uh, they have to do with uh, kind of being a people person. Tell us about that. Yeah, so I, I'm all in on the people side of the business and, and being, you know, it, it gets overused because people have made, like, being authentic a buzzword, but uh, I think it's actually wildly undervalued in application. Um, I, I think, you know, I wrote an article uh, how I wear Hawaiian shirts to a sales call because that's just who I am. Oh. And I messed up a lot trying to, to be different versions of myself or thinking that, Hey, you know, I'm a sales guy. I'm supposed to be all things to all people. And I was wrong. Um, hmm. be, be yourself and you'll find, uh, 
you'll, uh, you know, you'll find those that speak the same language as you and those that don't will, will weed themselves out and both parties will be better for it. Hey, so, if, you, if you saw, yeah. a, Jim, if you saw a guy on a beach with a giant cardboard, a uh, million dollar check, would you run and steal it from him? Oh, a hundred percent. And I would oh. try to, I'd be the guy trying to cash <laughs> it. Try to cash but it? Now, this is, I in wanna, the ATM I just, I or would you go the in the teller? <laughs> yeah, go into the teller. I don't know the last time I've been to a bank or a post office, but I'd try it. Yeah. I, you know, it's funny. You guys were talking, you guys were talking about that. And I was reminiscing about McDonald's. I don't know if I was a big time. Uh, I figured out how to game the Gatorade under the cap like challenge. Wow. Oh, you could turn had, it right. And like get it in the light. Yeah, and you could kind of see what it said. A hundred percent. And I probably had like 45 subscriptions to sports illustrated off that. Oh man. <laughs> I still never won anything cool, but <laughs> did you ever get the sneaker phone? Sports illustrated was cool. Or the football phone. I bet you couldn't do that with the grape kind. It, Why? It, no, that's, no, no, you, what you have to do is you don't no, look through the actual fluid. You turn it at an angle and then you can see where like the fluid is not. You can look at the oh. cap. It was a design flaw you know in the bottle. Saying. I do. And I used yep. to work at McDonald's and I'll tell you, it's very hard to win because we, um, I'm not saying how we came upon them, but we we opened like a case of the uh, the, the the drink cups, and we didn't win anything more than like like fries and a burger. You know, yeah. we won a lot of those. Yeah. But we got no Park nice. Place. You always got Park Place, but you couldn't get Boardwalk. Boardwalk was like unless you knew the head of security at the uh, marketing company. Apparently. Yeah, I had uh, infinite amounts of Baltic Avenue, big Baltic <laughs> Avenue. Yeah. Guy. Um, I like that. I like to be the slumlord in Monopoly. I like to get the like the two cheapest properties that you can first land on them up. and just build them up really quick. Yeah, that's a strategy. So what? Yeah, what's the strategy? Do you buy anytime you land on a property? Are you that guy that just buys them? No oh, yeah. questions yeah. asked. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. To... You have to. Yeah. What other yeah. is what other yeah. commodity is there on the board that's of any value yeah, other than gonna... property? Yeah, I mean money. It's a matter and... of time. Because then you can mortgage them and and that kind of thing. Do you play the? Do you know there's a yeah. rule in Monopoly that if you don't pay for it, it goes to an auction. Now, most people that, don't play that way. That is a style you can't, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Well. Yeah. yeah, how do they reach out and learn more, man? We got to, uh, we have our next guest waiting yeah. outside the booth. All right. Well, hey, big fan. Take it easy, guys. Appreciate you. How do they find out more, though? Where do they go and uh, continue the conversation with you? You know, uh, LinkedIn, is, that's my, uh, my battlefield of choice. So connect with me. I love connecting with all three PL people. Uh, and, uh, yeah, look forward to, to meeting anyone that comes my way. Nice. Thank well, you very nice much, sir. Nice to meet you. Appreciate it. Good time. Yeah, yeah love you know, talking to him. He says it. Uh, Friendly, uh, affable man. Being authentic is uh, a cliche or something. I haven't heard it as a cliche. No. And he well, seemed to be authentically and, and we, authentic. We go from Jamin Alvarez to Julian Alvarez. No Julian, relation. How you doing? <laughs> What's up, Good dude? Good to see you, man. Throw the cans on. Take, take, a, take a seat. Here you go. Listen in. They're, they're kind of, yeah, they're a little awkward at first if you never put them on, so... I'll help you out here. Oh, cool. There you Thanks. go. All right, where are you joining us from today? I'm actually coming in from Seattle. From Seattle. Yeah. Seattle. Wow. Seattle, is it uh, as rainy there as it is here? Yeah, it's actually kind of worse. Uh, worse. It's as rainy, but darker. Oh, you, okay, because you actually did some intel. Come to what? find out, we have, don't we have more rain here? Oh, yes. We have, a, we have a hell of a lot more. We have like 20 more inches. We have like 58 inches versus 38 inches in Seattle. That's crazy, man. I know. It's like Chicago. It's called the Windy City, but Boston's really the windiest city. So you want to start? I'm just saying. <laughs> Founder and CEO of Logic's Board right here, though. He talk about smart kids. Here's one. He's trying to uh, use software to bring together the logistics industry. But before he did that, he went to Carnegie Mellon, where he was a tartan. And a tartan, if you don't know, what is a tartan? A tartan is uh, <laughs> basically the guys that go around kind of in the Scottish uh, theme with the big skirts and going around and playing instruments. <laughs> Isn't that called a kilt? Aren't tartan. they going to get mad that yeah. you called it a skirt? The tartan, yes. It's a Scottish-Irish type of thing. All right, yeah, but I'm going to yeah, quiz yeah. you really quick on Carnegie Mellon, okay? Oh, so their campus is in Pittsburgh, but yep. I... I always talk about movies on here and people get mad. But so George Romero, do you know George Romero? No. Okay, he's a zomb big zombie film guy. He filmed one of his movies on the campus there. Okay. 1982's Creep Show. Okay. Around the Margaret Morrison Carnegie Hall. You familiar? Yeah, I am. Yeah. Wonder Boys with Michael Douglas, Toby Maguire, also okay. filmed there. Uh, Lorenzo's Oil, The Mothman Prophecy, Prophecies, Dogma. The Dark Knight Rises, Flashdance, yeah. Smart what do you think People, it is about Monkey Carnegie Shines. Mellon? Mean Girls 2. I didn't even know there was one, but that apparently Mean Girls 2 was even filmed there. And Rat, 
Apparently, this guy named Rat from the movie The Core, which is uh, a sort of not the best disaster movie, but it's the one where they have to go to the core of the Earth uh. to stop the Earth from like blowing up. It was it's a strange, but the he went to Carnegie Mellon. Cool, fascinating. As it a scientist from Deep Impact? Is it a great? Is it a great campus? Yeah, Carnegie Mellon's an awesome campus. Uh, great talent, kind of computer science focused. Um, but part of this, I think, is because they have a great. Uh, theater program as well, so that, that that makes a ton of sense. Did you oh. do any theater? Were you uh, no? No, I was econ, stat, uh, and actually never ended up using any of it. But yeah, uh, that's know. what college is for, yeah. right? <laughs> kind of like hang out and meet people. It sounds and like you try were, to make it through. You were taxiing on the runway, getting ready to fly, doing the things that you do yeah, now. For sure, you know, entrepreneurship is the way to go for me. He yeah. raised, Mike. Congratulations! You raised only a few months ago, four point two million in seed funding. Yeah, four point two million seed funding. Uh, VCs kind of out of uh, Boston, Seattle, and California as well. Well, that's wow, great. Boston. So, Where about some Boston? Maybe I know him. Uh, F Prime. Oh, no, I don't. Okay. Well, tell <laughs> us about me. tell us about Logic's board cool. and uh, what you guys got going on with it. Yeah, look. So we are building kind of the digital platform and the digital solution for the freight forwarding space. So we basically serve freight forwarding companies, international logistics. We integrate to their freight management systems and really take care of that kind of end user workflow. So helping them provide better visibility, better analytics, better workflow solutions for their customers, which are millions of shippers globally. Yeah, you guys, you're on a mission to break down the silos, right? Yeah, absolutely. What's the uh, what's the biggest inefficiency going on in freight right now that you guys want to attack? We we often declare war on detention, right, Chad? Yes. <laughs> yeah. Freight waves is declared. There you <laughs> we go. declared. We did all this weekend on radio, too. I don't know how well it worked in 2019. But... A lot of callers were getting heated yeah, about that. Sure. So, look, if you think about a freight forwarding operation, it's just a lot of people internally. These are non-asset-based companies. They have a ton of people answering the phone, answering emails of customers trying to figure out where their goods are, trying to communicate and interact with them. Because that's such a labor-intensive process, it really eats at the margins of freight forwarding companies. So that's really the biggest problem that we're trying to solve here. Just How visibility. Can we take visibility, transparency, better analytics, but really workflow online. How can ah. you scale better with technology as opposed to having to scale with more and more people? Like taking the decision-making process out of it, maybe like like putting together the emails and the spreadsheets. Sure, it's you know it's basically helping these companies move towards a more self-serve model, where their customers are going online to do a lot of the queries, to request bookings, to interact with them in a much more efficient way, as opposed to having to do it with phone calls, emails, Excel tables, etc. Hey, we were talking before you came on air beforehand a little bit about Columbia, right? Yeah. You have a little bit of background yeah, there, definitely. and. Uh, and I said, you know, a lot of Americans, they have this impression that Colombia is just narcos, right? And yeah. you were like, that is crazy. There's not like like heads rolling all over the ground or anything and everyone just moving drugs around. Yeah. It's a much different those are much different place. Up in the up in the forests. Yeah. No, that's oh, you just gotta go. You gotta go out. You gotta go for a hike to find those. No. What, well, so what's up with Colombia? Why is that a big hot? Why is that becoming a big hot? Yeah. Look, I mean, Colombia since the 80s, 90s, early 2000s has transitioned to be a completely different country. It's a really great economy. There's really great startup talent and a lot of entrepreneurship going on. So if you think kind of about the biggest uh, innovators in, in the Latin American space, which is booming, uh, Rappi has done incredibly well. They've raised over a billion dollars. Wait, how'd you, I like how you said that. Rappi. Say that again. Uh, Rappi. Rappi. Wow. Yeah. There's a big misconception in terms of just Colombia, what role it plays in the economy, what role it plays in general. Uh, but it's a great place to start a business. We have customers there. We have a lot of friends that have started companies there successfully. And it's actually a place where a lot of the venture of the Bay Area in terms of Latin, Latin America is going towards Colombia. First Brazil, then Colombia, then Mexico. Wow. Um, direct so flights country. from like Miami? Like easy and access? Direct flights from Miami, San Francisco, oh, LA, wow. pretty much everywhere in the world. I mean, okay. you know, the capital of, of Colombia, which is Bogota, has what, right. 9 million people. Yeah, a lot of support um, infrastructures going yeah. there now. The time zone's much better than like India, for example. Certainly. And like yeah. India's gotten a bit of a stigma, so you put it over in Central yeah. America, people you can get down there, do business quicker. Yeah. Same I mean, time actually, zone. Amazon Amazon just uh put up a customer success operation down in Colombia. I think they're wow. hiring like eight hundred people, so great space. Good time. Fantastic. So what do you you got that four point two million burning a hole in your pocket, or <laughs> what are you guys gonna do with that seed? Yeah, look, we're you? we're investing really heavily into product. We have a really kind of Big product roadmap, first visibility, analytics, uh, bookings, quoting, PO management, etc. So a lot of it is just continuing to innovate and to deliver a better product for our customers, but also customer success. We really believe that we have to be a strong digital partner for these companies. So we invest heavily into customer success, 
into making these digital rollouts uh, successful and implementations for our customers, that's really where the bulk of the financing is going towards. And obviously for us internally, just kind of ramping up marketing and sales as well. So what? you've got a product currently or are you, you, you... Yeah, the logic for it. Yeah, so we're, so we're actually going to market with a new product uh, next week. That's what I heard. So yeah, you, yeah. you tease us with it. Let us know what's up. Yeah, sure. So look, it, it, it's directly integrated to some of the freight management systems in the space. We really focus on kind of customer facing workflows better visibility, better track and trace, and really great analytics for the end user. Uh, those are kind of the two biggest problems that we found we had to solve on behalf of freight forwarding companies across the globe. Wow, how do people go and learn more? Uh, look, logicsport.com, uh, that, that's yeah, really the, the best place to reach us, uh, or just add me on LinkedIn. Nice, since it's your first time on the show, you have to hit the cap ah, too. cool. <laughs> Thank you. Logic's board. We appreciate Logic's Coming board. your way. Thank, Thank you for joining us. Logic's with an X if you're interested. <laughs> yeah, we appreciate it. Thanks Thank for you coming guys. in. All right. Oof. We have, this is kind of Thanks kind of so the, much, uh, Julian. The economic show. I've been talking to, um, before he came in here, I was talking to yeah. the, uh, the, what's it called? The founder of Emerge. Oh, really? Andrew Leto. Wow. Yeah. So you've had, are you getting schooled today? I am. You know, he recommended a great book. He recommended, so talk about Carnegie Mellon. So here's how this all ties together. Not only are they founders in logistics, but Carnegie, right? Yeah. He wrote a book called Thinking Rich or Thinking of Growing Rich. Okay. I can't remember. I have to listen back to my own episode. I know I should remember because we only talked a couple minutes ago. But it, it's it's like the book that uh, even The Secret and Tony Robbins and all of those guys based their things on. That'll be on Freight Waves Insiders on Thursday of next week. <laughs> but in the meantime, Insert we got promotion. Mr. Freightonomics here with us. Got the music queued up? Of course I do. I need some cowbell and Freightonomics. You need some cowbell for it? Yeah. Oh, just drop some in there in the yeah. beginning of it? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Well, it's great to have you on, Hello. man. Great, yeah, if you great turn to have. on Freight Waves TV on Wednesdays at 2 o'clock, you would recognize this gentleman or Freight Waves Now. That's right. Or uh, many of the other assets you appear on. Yeah. You're getting a little harder to come by now that you're on Freight Waves Now every single day. Oh. You got your own podcast. I'm always here for you, Chad. Oh, I'm always here. Yeah. Wow. Way I'm to butter a guy He's accessible. Uh, Thank <laughs> you. So, Anthony, so what we hear... Sometimes that you can get caught up in the doom and gloom of things, especially in headlines. If it bleeds, it leads. Right. We hear about Coyote. They lose 25 people. Definitely sad. Definitely it's close to home. We've heard about other layoffs throughout the industry. But the economic data shows even in transportation, there's a lot. There's way more growth going on than there is attrition. Yeah. And so there's a lot of catalysts, I would say, um, that we should be looking forward to that are, that are signs of optimism. Um, Zach and I usually kind of go back and forth. And Zach Strickland, my co-host, um, we go back and forth a lot of times. Uh, he, a lot of times, a little bit more pessimistic than I am. I'm a little bit more optimistic on a few things. Yeah. So we balance each other out very nicely. But I think yeah. we're looking at uh, business activity. Um, that was a little bit slower in the most recent GDP numbers. But um, non-defense capital goods and orders starting to kind of make a little bit of a comeback. So that's something that's really indicative of business to business activity and. Uh, Really something to kind of be optimistic about. And construction spending. Yeah. Okay, well, yeah, that's great. You know, and there's, there's. let me give you some of the bad news then, Mr. Yeah. Optimist. Let's hear it. There's been a black swan event. And you oh. can't predict black yes. swan events, except for you can say that there will be black swan events. Yeah. But so a black swan event that's really disrupting it, you can't escape the media about it. We're afraid that it could be, uh, what is it, a pandemic? Yeah. The coronavirus. Right, right. It's, I mean, the news every day. Like, yeah. they're shutting things down. What and and yet you're so optimistic and you're seeing yeah. this. Is that not playing into a global economic outlook right now? I, it, I think it does. You have to factor it in, um, especially when you're starting to look at how big of an impact it is on the uh, China as a country. Because now we're looking at it, it. It originally happened during the Chinese New Year, and so that's a very somewhat I wouldn't say convenient timing, but interesting timing, because they already kind of shut down. Right. They prepped for it. But the thing is, is like that's also a huge consumption time for for Chinese uh, right. residents, and so that that those uh, quarantines really kind of restrict a lot of that consumption, and that's really going to eat into I think their their GDP, and then that's also going to eat into some of the China consumption, and that's also going to I think play a huge role into uh, the global economy for sure. Now, Black Swan, the Oscars were on last night, right? That's and right. Black Swan, do you guess how many? Well, they how many? I loved that movie. How many Academy Awards did it win? Oh, this is probably a trick question. It probably didn't win many because it, well, it was nominated won. for one, two, three. It was nominated for five. Uh, one, three, 
It won one. Natalie Portman, uh, she won yeah! Best Actress, but it was up for Best Picture. It was up for Best Director, Best Cinematography, Best Film Editing. It's uh, it's Darren Aronofsky. All his movies are a little weird. Uh, Requiem yeah. for a Dream. I took a girl on a date mm. to that once, and uh, she was like, "Why did you take me to wow, this movie?" Wow, what a pick. I'm like, I don't. I didn't. <laughs> did you have any follow up after that? Uh, I, it didn't last long after that. No, oh. no, it did not. Requiem for Dream, not a great date movie. Oh, for not, the viewers yeah. out there, if you're not wondering. the Netflix. And Maybe Black Swan film. wasn't either. I don't no, know. No, that is it's it's messed up, right? It's is really it, yeah. disturbing. She's like a ballerina who gets like mental issues, and but you're not sure what's going on. The point of view is incredible. On. The camera's always kind of like right behind yeah. her and shaky. Mm. Well, I bring all this yeah, nonsense yeah, up because yeah. why do they call it a Black Swan event? Well, so I, I think it comes back down to it's a it was a um, a Russian author that kind of coined the term. Uh, black swan event i forget the name of the book it's but uh that's where it originates from well uh, we're not trying to put you on the spot no no <laughs> no I gotta, no i gotta i gotta look into that one though. here's something you should know although i do a lot of shows because sometimes i don't remember what i just talked about i was trying to t recount a story to chad from freightways insiders about this book that carnegie wrote called uh think think growing rich or think and grow rich think and grow rich that's it yeah. all right yeah all well, right, there so, you go. You came through right there. <laughs> so, yeah, you are a better quizzer of, of what's in my head than, than I am. So Andrew Leto was in here from Emerge, and he was uh -huh. talking about how to start Global Trans, he was in the Navy. He didn't even go to college. He was in the Navy. He was a sonar tech in the Navy. He got out of the Navy. He read that book. Yeah. And then he uh, was like, wait a second. You know, nobody's better than me who makes a company and decided to start Global Trans. Yeah, yeah. Fascinating stuff. Yeah. It's about the power of your own mind, Chad. Wow. Yeah. I need Unlock to tap it. into that a little you bit. You got to just be like, look, everyone's just as dumb as I am. <laughs> they're not any smarter, at least. Yeah. It's just right? tricking yeah. people. What was Freightonomics about, though? Freightonomics, the most about? recent episode was about, it was a trailer talk. So talking about oh. the different trailer types. Ah. Uh, refurb, that sounds exciting. And flatbed. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure you made it exciting. We made it a blast. What do you got? What do you got coming up on it? So I, I'm thinking I might have to rotate in a few uh, hosts in there. Oh. So, yeah. Oh, yeah. No, oh, Strickland. Yeah. Ziggity Stricky. He's no in uh, Colorado. Yeah. He's yeah. out there. He's out there in Colorado. So um, I don't think we're going to cancel it. I think we're gonna yeah. go, I think the show's going to move forward. Must go on. Must go on. You should bring in, you should do like a uh, great anomics and bring in one of the great quarter guys. Like uh, Andrew Cox. I had him on radio. He is He's, he's Andrew's dynamite. Great. I like him. Andrew's great. Yeah. Yeah. I love going because he has a perspective of certain things that I don't think of. Yeah. And so, like, we can kind of, kind of. Really, Which is amazing because yeah. he's like 21. So, in yeah. his 21 yeah. years, he's gained a lot of, he's like the boy wonder of freight. Yeah. The amazing thing is, is like, he really comes up to speed on different subjects very quickly. Yeah, he does. Yeah. 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 It takes, so it's taken Chad 46 years to get up on some of them. <laughs> We're all still learning. Though. No, still I'm always there. amazed. Yeah, I started I, when I was yeah one. Sometimes <laughs> learning gets harder. Sometimes learning gets harder when you get older, though, because you have sort of these these biases and mm -hmm. these preconceived notions, even if you don't realize it. Yeah, yeah. Oh it's... no, I don't. <laughs> <laughs> A lot of times we're hardwired sometimes, and so yeah. undoing that, creating some neoteny, I think is the word, is to denial to... ain't just a river. Huh. No. Yeah. No. In uh, Egypt. All right. What's what uh what else you got? What's what's next for Anthony when you leave the booth? Uh, I, I think I might jump on a few calls. Yeah. Um, for 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 those freight fanatics okay. that are kind of watching certain KPIs in the economy. So they just call you up. Uh, sometimes I get emails. A Smith at freightwaves dot com. Okay. Uh, yeah. So just call them up. Call me. Call have a conversation. <laughs> Hit me up. Yeah. Look them up on LinkedIn. Okay. Yeah. I appreciate Look me it. up on LinkedIn. Yeah. So yeah. I always love talking to the the clients and the viewers and people in the industry. Okay. If you want some optimism in the economy, you know where to find exactly. it. Well, send uh send Mike B in here. I gotta beat him no. in market expert trivia. Bowden distal. Yes. Yes. I don't even try it anymore. I've been practicing. I've screwed it up so many times. Bowden distal, uh, just like it's spelled as he tells yes. you. <laughs> just like it's spelled. Oh, that's not it. Here we go. There we go. Market expert trivia. Market expert trivia. Market expert trivia. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Another game. What is this one called? Oh. Here come our market experts to play market expert trivia. Well, we yeah, are so yeah. honored to have you in here, Ooh, Mr. You guys know Intermodal how this Rail Specialist. Yeah, yeah. All right, that's his buzzer. It sounds <laughs> okay. like this. This is my buzzer. It sounds like Get that. Get as close as you like to it. Okay. He reads the answers. we got to wait till he's done. Okay. Yes. So, now you got to keep your palm here. Okay. It's, it's, palms hard, are sweaty. it's hard to beat you. To, Did to you the, see? I know, <laughs> right? Speaking of palms are sweaty and mom's spaghetti, did you see Eminem at the uh, Grammys last night? No, didn't watch it. No. Oh. Uh, the grand, no, well, not the grand, the Oscars. <laughs> so, the Grammys is, is the yeah. music, the Oscars. For today's market expert okay. trivia, we are joined by what we just said, our intermodal specialist, Mike Bowden Distal, and our focus is on mode of transportation and keeping it 
rail. Yes. All right, number Open one. Rail. Question number one. Okay. Starting easy. Wait, are Basic. these are these multiple choice? Multiple choice. Okay. And, the, and they they all only right, go to wait to, until D. They only go to D. Yeah, you have to wait until yes. it reads the whole okay. thing. Okay. Mode of transportation, M O T, means A, how you ship any product. B, how you ship domestic products. C, how you ship products abroad. D, how you ship vessels, air, and rail only. Yes. What? A, how you ship any product. I, that is incorrect. No. It. <laughs> it's how it's how you mode of transportation. M O T is how you move the goods. So it can be by a truck or by rail, or by an airplane, yes. or by a vessel. So what is it, A, B, C, or D? I don't remember what order they're in. It is in. C, yes, thank how you. you ship products abroad, Yes. according to our infographics. So you guys, wow, our market experts are off to a roaring start. <laughs> I just told you the answer. <laughs> Yeah, no, those are different types of them, but yeah. they are those that move abroad. They're not just, they're not domestic. But, but there no, could be different, our infographic is wrong. There our... could be different <laughs> modes domestically. Yes, right? yes. Look, I'm Your just... infographic is wrong. <laughs> <laughs> well, take it up with freight waves. I will. All right, we put that on there. Uh, number two, the busiest rail border port in the U.S. is A, Port Huron, Michigan, B, Detroit, Michigan, C, Laredo, Texas, or D, TTI Retailer. It's uh, Laredo, Texas. You guys didn't let me get to That what? is correct. All right. That is yeah. correct. It's way bigger than the rest. Um, yes. Yeah. In fact, it's uh, uh, put together. <clears throat> if you put Port Huron and Detroit together, you would slightly beat Laredo. Yes. Gives you an, a, They're a in that top three, though. Of its size. Right. Yeah. Top three. Yeah. Motor vehicles and parts is by far the top transporter rail commodity. Mike, you probably know that. What is the second largest commodity? Is it A, computers and parts, B, mineral fuels, C, plastics, or D, electrical machinery? Yes. Fuel. Mineral fuels it is. That is correct. Last year, mineral fuels represented about $1.1 billion in, uh, in movement in uh, computer and parts. Dooner, we're just about 0.7. Huh? Yeah. I mean, if that's what you were. What? For, bo <laughs> for, for a bonus, do you guys know what's the difference between a mineral fuel and a fossil fuel? One's from the dinosaurs, and the other is from a rock. <laughs> That's a good try. So, so what, would be, what would be an example of a mineral fuel? Well, what's like, the basic uh, Evian distinction? Like water? The basic distinction is that mineral, <laughs> minerals are considered renewable, and fossil uh, fuels are considered not. Yeah, because, it, okay. well, you ever see Jurassic yeah. Park? Uh, <laughs> yes. <laughs> I read it before the movie came out. Yeah, Michael yeah. Crichton. Yeah. Uh, number four, last year, Transborder Rail moved how much freight? A. 19.5 billion, B, 16.5 billion, C, 14.5 billion, or D, 12.5 billion. Yes. And C. You were cheating on the clutch there a little bit. C, 14.5 billion is correct. Yeah. For a f bonus follow-up, was this up or down from the previous year? Was it? It was uh, down. That is correct. Yeah. Come on. Come on. You had your chance. I know. He's just yeah. Yeah. He got no, lace. It, it, he lost himself. It was... You want to know why it's why it was down? Sure. Okay. So it's, the, it's not a bonus bonus <laughs> question. The, the intermodal was down cross border because the peso was weak, which means there's uh, been you know shift from rail to, to truck. So that's been part uh -huh. of it. Also in Canada, the been less lumber going from Canada to the U.S. Yeah. 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 Because it was both. Right. Yeah. Nice. Yep. Uh, you ever okay. get like a Canadian quarter when you like? I don't even really use cash Never. ever anymore. But you ever no. get screwed with a Canadian quarter? Never. That happens all the time up in in Boston. I guess because more people are going through the border, but maybe it, wow. I, it doesn't happen here, I guess. Not at all. Never? No. You never get stuck with a Canadian quarter? No. Oh. Never. Never heard of such a thing. I have. Yeah. 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 Well, you haven't lived here very long. You you live closer <laughs> to the border. And it happened already? Yeah. yeah, it happens all the time. Uh, B. How much trans... I mean, <laughs> B. Uh, five. B! <laughs> <laughs> um, I didn't necessarily ruin it. Five. Okay. How much transporter rail... Uh, how much was transporter rail down from the previous year, now that we've established that it was? A, 3.9%, B, 4.9%, C, 5.9%, or D, 7.9%. Yes. C, 5.9%. No, it was. A. No, B. neither. D, 7.9%. Oh. That's good for me. Right. Um, for a bonus follow-up, which was down more, Mexico or Canada? Yes. Mexico, because of that peso. That is incorrect. What? So it was Canada, Canada right? <laughs> there you get the answer. Yeah, right. Oh, even, it was can't. close. It was All close. Right. I think you did. You edge him by a by a yes. by a, uh, a half an point. Answer. Yes. But uh, was hey, that it? That was great. Yeah. Oh, all right. Well, that was, 
Oh, it's a half point victory. Good game. Good game. Hey, there, there we go. There we go. There we go. Thanks for playing. I think it was probably more close to tied, but we'll, you know. Okay. I'm still going to contest that number one. Right, Bowden Distal? we got to contest that first answer. Yeah. yeah All right, it's Emily Zink time now. Where's Emily big Zink? Deal. Here, let's get some air. Talk about here. big deal, little deals. we got to bring Emily Zink. Big deal. In Come on in. Where is she? Come on, Emily Zink. Don't big time. It's oh, big Emily deal. Emily Zink. Is she not going to make it? We're gonna have to, we should have to have Mike Budenstitzel read this for us. Here she comes. It's Bowden Distal. Deal. Bowden Distal. Yeah. Big deal. Hey. Little, little deal. It's warm in here, isn't it? Oh, man, it's toasty. Just a little bit. Oh, man. Yikes. Oh. Yeah. You guys have been really basking yeah. in all the glory in here. Oh, it's right. Delicious. Yeah. <laughs> Scratch your screen, you'll be able to smell. Oh, God. Yep. No, don't do okay. that. Man, it's this light. <laughs> Yeah. It is, but it looks good. We look really good. So, oh, what's is it the worth it? I don't know if I'm going to start looking good. Is the beauty sweating. worth it? I think it is, guys. All right. So, who who goes first this time? It, I believe it's this gentleman. Okay, sure. So, that means that you wanted to do the second and fourth and sixth. I see how you are. What? Yeah, no, not that, not, no. I didn't even fine. game it like that. It's fine. Oh, man. Well, before before I switch two of them around, so you'll okay. see why. Oh, see? I, sometimes, she, you oh. think that, sometimes you think I uh, forget them, but this time I really purposely switched them around. Okay. So we've been talking a lot about AB5. So despite a federal judge putting a pause on AB5, oh. California owner operators are continuing their truck-friendly relocation search. Big deal or little deal? A lot of drivers moving out of California. Moving. I think it's a big deal it's uh it's they're in these these owner operators they're in limbo they are still having to sell their houses even though they they feel a sense of gratitude i guess for like the pause that's been put on it but no one really knows they're living in a time of uncertainty and so plans to get out of the anti-truck california space are very real and of course there's even the threats of like well actually not only may california do it but Will it be adopted nationwide? So it's mm. a time of uncertainty. I'm going to say big deal. Hey, uncertainty is bad for business, right? We see that with all the supply chains, hearing about the trade war in China, and now you have coronavirus and all these things that are making people rethink where they base their operations out of in their overseas. Well, the same thing happens in our on our shores when regulation comes in place. And with us, with AB5, it's making people scared, especially smaller owner-operators, if they're going to be able to work and operate in this environment. So even though nothing may come of it, that stay of execution may stay forever, it may not go through, people already have to make other plans. You can't just wait for whatever legislation or whatever politicians are going to do. So it's a pretty big deal. No, it was interesting. We no, actually, no, it's not. It's a little deal. <laughs> oh, oh, you didn't oh. want to agree yeah. with me. This yeah, is only a it's, couple. It's a few team yeah. drivers. Oh. Well, it was cool, though, because the couple that we featured on FreightWaves.com, yeah. they were looking at three Tennessee cities. And so, of course. That always makes it seem bigger when you yeah. actually feature a human. It, but then when you're like 30,000 people were like laid off or 112,000 were hired, yeah. you're like, it's just a number. Yeah. It's all just a number to you, isn't Until it? Until it becomes a story. Yeah. Well, and it's like they, they're not, it's not real people. Well, there's the old saying, like, the death of one is a tragedy, right? Something like that. Who said that? <laughs> I believe it was Marilyn Manson. <laughs> okay. Sure. The yeah. Oregon Trucking Association opposes a state cap and trade bill to limit emissions from polluting industries. But Keith Wilson, the president of Titan Freight System, says regulation is necessary to accelerate the transition to clean fuel vehicles. Dooner, big deal or little deal? Ro- I don't know. Robert Ma- Robert Kasakim. No, Kaskaman. Robert Kaskaman just says, I am online now. Hey, All Robert. Right. Hi, Robert. Thanks for, Glad, thanks, for thanks for shouting out. Um, <laughs> so is this a big deal or a little deal? What Keith Wilson said. Keith Wilson. Um, he was one of the Beach Boys. Uh, That's Brian Wilson. Oh, <laughs> this cap and trade thing, man. This gets people really heated, right? Yeah. Uh, he, uh, President, he says regulation is. Ne- Sorry, I was reading his comment. I wasn't oh, paying attention okay. when you did it. Uh, the Alex, I, I think clean fuels are a big deal. I would like to have that happen. <laughs> to you, Chad. Oh, great. Thanks. Just let me st- step right into the... Yeah, P- um, uh, a lot of... Okay, this is an interesting one. I would... Huh, it, yeah, I, um, <laughs> I, th- that's interesting. I think that his particular resistance is a little deal in hmm. what could... Is the, the... What Oregon is trying to do is a big deal. Uh, but, um, man, there is so much resistance. And he lays out... What is maybe a big deal argument? I thought it was very rational. It was very, uh, it wasn't like, I'm t- it's like, hey guys, look, if we can advance the industry a little bit here, 
we can like say, look, okay, right at first, this this the front end investment of a two hundred thousand dollar vehicle may be a little bit more, but over the eighteen months that you'll be using it, first of all, you will spend less over the life cycle of it. So let's use a little, let's advance our technology, let's do stuff that's good for the environment, and in the end, you will actually save money too. So let's have an open mind. That's his argument. But yeah. man, it's. It, I guess sometimes when emotions are riding high, it doesn't matter if uh, if you're speaking logic. Well, there's distrust, too. So over the weekend on Freight Waves Radio, we had a lot of callers come in when we were talking about trucker parking. Now, this isn't cap and trade, but someone had we were talking about regulations. Remember that headline we read last week, Chad, where was a bipartisan bill was going to give money to parking? Well, yes. a lot of truckers, they were not in agreement with that because they were like, no, the government's just going to waste the money. They're like, for $100,000 or a million dollars, you'll get a dirt road with five parking spots if you let well, the government you're, handle it. you're right. It. There is distrust, but I think there was one thing specific about that bill that it will only and only be used for increasing trucking parking. Until it ends up in the general fund, right? I mean, I'm not saying it will, but they, a lot of them That's seem to people think people so. People feel that yes. way. Yeah, and, yep. yeah. People get passionate about certain topics and... Any kind of regulation yeah. people will talk about. Yeah. Well, El Paso Border Control agents bust two commercial trucks carrying $2 million worth of marijuana. Oh. Big deal or a little deal? It's like a nothing burger. We've heard much bigger busts, <laughs> right? I mean, yeah. I mean, $2 million worth of marijuana, like, based on what? I mean, high grade, low grade, <laughs> dirt weed, uh, Mexican what swag. You know, it, it all depends on the kind. Um, well, you know you know how they said that they found it? They, they found it was an aluminum foil, right? Dog sniffing... Drug sniffing dogs and high technology. Oh, you know, oh, right? wow. Oh, is that the pun? Yeah. Okay. The, the techno. <laughs> I remember why I included this. I included this as an excuse to talk about the dogs we met at Air Cargo 2020. Oh, I thought you were going to say to talk about marijuana. Which, oh, by the way, we dogs. can't call them dogs. We have to call no, them canine professionals. They are professionals. <laughs> canine they're, professionals. They are not dogs. That's guys. right. No, they are. We like tried to have one come on the show. We were very excited. Like, maybe we'll get one of these um, canine professionals to come on the air. But they were like, no, he's working. Yeah. I'm like, well, what, then what are you doing if you come on the show? Whoa! Yeah. Uh, yeah. Wait, that one's us. No, they I were nice the people. I one, Tesla. We met a, a four-year-old black lab named Tesla. Yeah. He was very cool. He works at the McCormick Place and at uh, the O'Hare Airport. Yeah. So. Home of Freight Waves Live. Everything yeah. just interconnects. It was really crazy. Yeah. Seven degrees removed. Yeah. Yes. So yes. it's true. What do you think, Chad? So what do you think? Big deal or little deal about this bust? Well, I think it's kind of a little deal, but, you know, it was cool. It was cool the way, you know, through the... Uh, the, the smart, the intel they were seeing, like there's different, it's hard, there's different kinds of trucks coming through, there's flatbeds, there's like, car they're, they're carrying foil. How do we know? Listen well, to Freightonomics about they trailers. They look for little <laughs> anomalies, oh. right? And they look for, and they have their high technology and their drug sniffing dogs, and you put it all together, and then you can bust some marijuana coming through. You want to uh. know how you bust people driving on I-83 in Nebraska? How? How? Colorado plates. Oh, is that what they poor do? Poor folks. Yes. Oh. U-Hauls are Colorado plates. I. It, it's usually. And they the, just bust the people yeah. going to Colorado. Yeah, with Colorado oh. plates in Nebraska, because chances are they're transporting something they think. What? Um, what if yeah. they're just transporting their family? Well, you could usually tell when somebody's up to oh. no good. So why? Yeah, oh, why? They've gotten. A, I they don't have know. like one of those like drug rug sweaters on. Oh my god! Yes. Oh, all the yeah. time. They, oh wow. So this is why this Got, bus. Like, a yeah. Beanie on or this something? is why this. Yeah. <laughs> it's when they roll down the window, it smells. No, it's usually oh. like edibles that they have, like the gummies oh. and stuff. But yeah, this bus seems very small compared to what I'm used to covering. But anyways, oh. according to a memo obtained by Bloomberg News, Foxconn Technology Group told its employees at a Shenzhen facility not to come back to work today. This was also the day that a lot of people set in place for the extended Lunar New Year break because of the coronavirus. So I was wondering if a lot of people were going to actually head back to work today or if employers were going to say, no, this virus is getting even worse, stay home. So is this a big deal or a little deal? It seems pretty contagious, that, and it seems fairly deadly, right? Yep. So uh, I think it's a it's a big deal because Foxconn is uh, a gigantic, uh, they're, they're the largest private employer in, in China, and so it's a it's a high profile symbol. They're what they they work with. They're a supplier of parts for Apple. Yeah. Uh, this is a big deal of the uncertainty of this black swan event that is known as the Wuhan coronavirus. Yeah. It, well, it's a big. So it's one of those things. Like Doctor Radio called in on radio this weekend, and there was that ten cent report that came out that said it was like twenty six thousand plus people who had died, and the infections were a lot higher. The doctor said he wasn't sure if it's true, but he thinks that China's probably fudging the numbers. It's something yeah. like 
Seven hundred or nine hundred? I can't. I don't mean any disrespect. Nine hundred. Yeah. And then there was Making a comment. It lower or higher? Well, that nine. There, there, there's thing that's lower. The the the, the debt toll is lower okay. than what it is because they wouldn't want to. They'd want to conceal it because it can hurt your GDP. It's it's bad. It causes oh. panic. People don't want to just closing factories like this iPhone factory. Oh. But one of the comments was like, well, per capita, that would be like if two hundred and twelve people in the United States died of a disease, like. It, everyone would forget in a day. And I'm like, no, they wouldn't. 12 people died from vaping. And like, that was a huge story yeah. for like weeks. So I think that if people are dropping dead of a disease here, yeah, maybe like 212 is 0.0x percent of the U.S. population, but it's pretty scary. There's a uh, there's a couple, right, that um, yes. we're probably going to yeah. get to that. Uh, they, yeah, well, you're we'll get going to, when to the we get next to one. Yes. Yeah, no, going right that, into okay. that. Yeah, a Chattanooga couple. So it's a big actually, deal. That's, yes, that's a, it, is it's among a big deal. several hundred passengers on board a Princess cruise ship off the coast of Japan that is quarantined right now. They have to stay in their cabins because of fear of the coronavirus. Is this a big deal? A little deal? That's frightening. It's a sucky deal. <laughs> well, Andrew Cox, he came back from a cruise and he was like, "Yeah, we were in the Bahamas and they took everyone of Asian descent off into like." their own quarantine to do their temperature and stuff. And then I was stuck in the booth here with them with the door closed. And I'm like, wait, well, hold on a second. Did, they didn't racial test Racial profiling. That well, really but all, yeah, well, I was like, if if they have the corona, like, wouldn't everyone else on the ship be susceptible? It. And, like, I don't see how that works. But, I mean, whatever it may be, that would be really scary to be stuck on a train. I was reading the article, and they were talking about, like, what kids do to stay in it. Because you're stuck with your parents. In your own quarters. I don't know. That's why I hate cruise ships. I really, days. I hate the idea of a cruise if ship. I, I, I would never want to go on one. No. If I had spent five thousand, ten thousand dollars to go on this cruise, and I'd been saving up for years, and it was supposed to be my dream vacation, and now it was becoming hell on earth, and I was in jail and being quarantined with people who might be more likely to get me sick. Yeah, I would think that that was a big deal. I can imagine you freaking out. Yeah, sure. I can imagine. Oh, yes, yeah. I don't think you take he this would, well. Every I would, hour, he'd be like, would, can we go now? Yeah. Can we I would go be, now? You're Are right, guys. You know me well. I'm going to take a dinghy. You know me pretty well. I'm get, can I jump off this boat? That's, like, right. No, Chad, That's right. That's what I'd be trying to do. I'd be like, I'm, I'm swimming. I'm going. Like, here. I'm going. I'm going to go radio a helicopter. I don't care what you say. Uber copter. <laughs> oh, right. gosh. Well, DSV slash, is it called... Panopina. Panopina is pushing for exclusive deals with shippers that bar them from using other freight forwarders. Your turn, Duner? No, it's his. I your, your turn. Big yeah. deal or little deal on this one? I mean, I mean, it's a big deal for that industry. But like, you know, we talk about like we're saying, oh, the uh, the contract rates aren't really worth the paper they're written on. Well, how about a real contracted rate? This is a real deal where it's like this is a contract rate. It might be a little bit of monopolizing some of the space probably won't work very well little deal mm, it's it's i don't <laughs> the problem is i don't think it'll stick as he mentioned with the contracts people i mean the way most shippers base their supply chains especially bigger ones who would even be tempted to, to do some sort of exclusive deal are be, they use a number of different freight forwarders. They don't put all their eggs in one basket. You know, they usually don't split it up that way. So yeah, just wait till what service gets bad or rates yeah. go the bad a bad direction. I think it's bad for the industry if it sticks. I do because especially on some of those lanes, they're talking how it was a specialized good. They were the turbines they were trying to build it out on. That means no one else will be able to build network density there. That means they'll be able to control that market and have that monopoly, which is a very powerful thing in shipping. So um, I think for the just in fairness and fair play, I think that uh, I hope it doesn't stick. And yeah. so you're saying. Big deal. Only a big deal if it sticks, but I don't think it will. So a little oh, deal. Okay. So in between deal yeah. at the moment. Yes. Joaquin Phoenix wins Best Actor, but chastises the audience for <laughs> drinking milk. Yeah. Oh man. Parasite mm. wins Best Picture, and American Factory wins Best Doc. And Eminem both surprises and confuses <laughs> attendees by performing his 2002 hit "Lose Yourself." Uh, yeah. So all right. Wow. Big I deal or little deal? There's a lot going on. I, I watched yeah. the Oscars last night. It was. It was. Um, yeah, there was a lot going on. There were commercials. There was a lot going on that I'm not going to get into. There was just there were things that were just strange yeah. during the Oscars. But the thing I thought was weirder than Eminem showing up was that they were talking about like movies that you can't separate the song from, and one of them was like The Bodyguard. And I was like, who thinks about the bodyguard? Oh, that that's Whitney the Whitney Houston. Yeah, like, see? Still thinking it's so. that okay, what maybe. song? And yeah. I Will Always and, Love You. Yeah, and, you I know, guess maybe. Uh, maybe so. Top Gun, Highway to the Danger Zone. Well, sure, but like. I, I just thought the bodyguard was a little silly. It made like thirteen million dollars in theaters. I know the record sold a lot, but I don't think a lot of people actually saw the bodyguard. Yeah, you know, no. I, I they thought think of the music. Video. I thought one thing you didn't mention is um the 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 creator of uh, Parasite who yeah. won. 
uh, Bong Joon Ho. You didn't give me a chance. I was sorry, still on the music. <laughs> oh, but he uh, man, he gave credit to Martin Scorsese, and yeah. Martin Scorsese was like, "Wow, you remembered this quote that I said." So he he I mean, gave him credit for that. Martin Scorsese is like pretty over. And you know? people know who he is. <laughs> and no, he was really floored by yeah. the quote, which is like fringe about friends oh. and. Uh, Low places. And uh, I could. Do you want me to give you the quote? No. Okay. Oh, was it a good uh, one? Yeah, it was pretty good. I right. hear it, Chad. All right. Let's see. It is um, the most personal is the most creative. Okay. That's the quote. All right. And he said that, and it floored Scorsese. I thought that was cool. And then he gave a shout out to Quentin Tarantino, yeah. who had been a longtime supporter of his stuff. So I'm like, you know, I like this Bong guy. This this bong ho guy and I wanted to see Pe- Parasite. They kept it in the theaters here yeah. in Chattanooga. Yeah, it's on on demand. And I, can, I, I can really rent it. and I just kept not finding the time. And now it's three ninety nine to rent. Okay, on iTunes that won't be the same. So he, but um, the thing with Joaquin Phoenix is he's, out of he's his done mind. a lot of like he's done a lot of um like immersive character acting things. Remember like for like a year where he was oh, pretending yeah. he was that oh that right. sort of character. So then yeah. when he does this thing, I think that it confuses so many people because if you are of like sort of that extreme slant, like you're a militant vegan or something, you might be like, is he making fun of me? Like, I don't know if he's agreeing with me. And if you're not, you're like, dude, if you're just sort of moderate, you're like, dude, just chill out. Yeah. And from the other end of the spectrum, you're also like, and everyone in the, the audience was like, where's he going with this? Is he being the Joker right now? Is this, I know. Is like, this be, part of the character? Is he being Joaquin Phoenix or is he being Joaquin Phoenix or being Joaquin Phoenix? He wants or everyone to both? talk about him and yeah. that's what we're doing. I guess so. so. What did yeah. you What did you think? I, I didn't see that, but I saw Eminem and I was like, what is going on? I was really confused. Yeah. And then when they, my favorite was when they would flash to people in the audience. And they were and like, some going? Were like yeah. going? And some people were like. Well, uh, really Elsa, confused. Elsa looked like, I don't know if she was making, like, if that's just her resting face, but she was like, I, yeah, she, like, she, she looked, had like a snarly yeah, face really, going on. I don't know if she was upset or she was like, yeah. The you know, is, I, don't know, I couldn't tell. I'm a big Joaquin Phoenix fan anyway, uh, even if he did do weird uh, things that were a little off tone or whatever. Yeah. I, I And I just really liked the Joker in its darkness. Yeah. I thought that he did a great job. He's versatile, does a lot of strange. So really, really cool. Good for him. What about American Factory? And so I'm going to say, big deal. I think American right, Factory. The, I'm American. with American Factory. I think that that was a good pick for the oh. best doc. It was, it was exciting. It's a good documentary. I, I have to right, see it. Get it on Netflix. And I think it was only it was Netflix had spent a lot of money to get some of their things positioned, but I think that's the only thing that okay. Won, that I'll have to done. check that out. You know what? By the way, I did see the only part that I caught of it was Brad Pitt accepting his award. Yes. First first uh, award ever. What? Right. That was first his first ever. For, yes, and he was huh. nervous, and you could hear it in. What his about voice. for Interview with a Vampire? And I was like, oh. <laughs> Oh, that he's was. he's oh, that was sad. <laughs> but not uh, I don't know seven. He didn't get for that. <laughs> no, he didn't oh. get it for that. Right. Or for the man, you know what, what about he California? Got, he got supporting actor for uh, A River Runs Through It. Oh. When he was really young. What about Seven Years yeah. in Tibet? Dude, I, I, I'm <laughs> just naming all of his. <laughs> what about Fight Club? That would that's the one he should have won one for. Yeah, yeah. What about everyone Fight knows Fight Club. Tyler Durden. No, no, he was totally. Shafted for that one. My wife got bored pretty quick during it in the first year. Like all the same movies are just getting nominated yeah. each time. Yeah. yeah. Toy Story Four, big one. I don't know that one. <laughs> I haven't made it all right. for you. What else is coming up this week on uh, Freightways TV? Well, second episode mm-hmm. on Wednesday of Put yeah. That Coffee Down. It yes. got a lot of great reaction, yeah. so I'm really excited for Freight this. Freight sales yeah. podcast for closers. And the cool thing is you could call in, and we mm. were getting people to call in that left and right. Cool. We didn't yeah. even yeah. put the, we didn't really advertise the number till that time, so we'll put the, the number up one? a little. Yep, same number every single time. 423-710-9777. Put it in your cell phone and speak no, that. It's not his Timothy number. Timothy Dooner's personal right number. Yeah, yeah, reach out to him, blow up his phone, let him know how we're doing. running that Zoom account. I love you, Chad. Yeah, that's not. That's our. That's oh. great. What's tomorrow? Great quarter guys. Yeah, right? great quarter guys. Always yeah. have. Yeah, they always have a great time. Andrew Cox and Kevin Hill, and we have a lot of stuff always going on, and it's great. You can now watch on Freightwaves.com if you've Ooh. noticed. If you scroll to our live stream, is on Freightwaves.com. So there anytime you go. you go to a story, anytime you just go on the homepage, you see it there. If you don't want to get on your app or get on YouTube or anything, get some oh. comments. Tahir. Tahir Kashid says just, hello. Hi. Hi. Tahir. Thank you. Hey, Thank you for watching. Yeah. How you doing? It was funny, though, because I was man. watching analytics uh, for our viewership, and our viewership has the most views in Anchorage, Alaska right wow. now. So I don't know. Shout out. <laughs> I don't know. Maybe Put those ice road truckers are watching or Shout something. Shout out, Anchorage. Yeah, yeah I love so, you guys. 
Very interesting. Yeah. All right. Let us know if you're in Anchorage and listen. Yeah. All right. Well, download the Freight Waves TV app. Subscribe to Freightcast. Get every single Freight Waves podcast all in one feed, or you can subscribe to them individually if you want. But hey, it's great for discovery. Yes. I, I'm even experimenting putting the morning minute on there. Oh, okay. Like, oh, I, I won't, it. it won't just be one ever. Like, I, I hide it from the RSS. So, like, today's will be Monday, and then tomorrow will vanish, and then, like, Tuesdays will be there. Yeah. But, you know, one minute, all in one feed. Just make, hey, it, make well. it easier, right? Each and every day, you're bringing it at 5 a.m., aren't you? Yeah, I get up early for that. <laughs> wow. wow. Anyway, the kids, my kids get up <laughs> early. Say. Kids don't sleep because you put it, what? I don't know why. You put them to bed at like 8 o'clock. No wonder they wake up at 5 in the morning. <laughs> right? Well, then put them to bed later. <laughs> I'm not fighting that I don't battle. Think, I don't think I'm that works. I'm not works. dying on that hill. Yeah. <laughs> you follow me at Timothy Duda, D O N E R, Emily Zink with the S Z and the I N K. Chad Prevost. Right on. Here. What, what? Truck? truck? Truck. It is like 110 degrees yeah, in this room. We, we need breathe. to put a thermometer in here. Oh. But the only place it's hotter than in here is it's hotter wherever you're sitting behind your computer because you just watch the show. Yeah. And that's what happens and when you we're on show. fire. And it's steamy. See you on Friday at 1 o'clock. Who will stop the rain? Hi, everybody. I'm Freightways meteorologist Nick Austin with your afternoon weather update here on Monday, January 10th. Hope you're having a good day so far, and we're going to talk about more snow coming back to the mountains out west. But first, we're going to talk about the eastern U.S. There's going to be a lot happening uh, over the next few days, not just today, but looking kind of ahead for the week. So we're going to go right into sonar critical events. We have the radar popped up. And uh, if we look down south first, we see a lot of heavy rain from parts of Texas, Louisiana, lower Mississippi River Valley, into parts of the Tennessee and Ohio River Valleys. That is going to continue on and off almost all week. So there's potential for some more flooding in parts of the uh, Tennessee Valley and other parts of the south, like there were late last week. So there could be just roadblocks here and there and maybe some problems on interstates with that. But even more importantly, heading up into the northeast parts of the Great Lakes, we have a watchtower alert up for a potential a strong winter storm, not a major storm, but certainly an impactful storm in this area from Michigan, northern Indiana, up in upstate New York, and interior portions of New England, so including places like Detroit, South Bend, over to Buffalo and Rochester, and then interior portions of New England uh, into the Green Mountains and the White Mountains, northern Maine as well. A lot of heavy snow. This is for Wednesday and Thursday, February 12th and 13th as well as areas of some strong winds and blowing snow. Not blizzard strength, but still can at least cause uh, sig some significant problems in the short term over these uh, couple of days uh, for, the fe for February 12th and 13th uh, with this storm. So just going to have to keep really close track of this particular storm. It's going to affect parts of southern Canada as well, possibly Toronto and Montreal, the Trans-Canada Highway. So we'll have to keep uh, track on that and just be weather aware of this situation. Now, this storm is going to be coming out of the west, out of the Rockies, uh, and uh, before it hits the northeast and the Great Lakes. Tonight and on Tuesday, more heavy snow coming back to parts of the Rockies, mainly Colorado and New Mexico, including parts of the Denver freight market, which have gotten hit by a lot of snow over the past week. Just the city of Denver has seen about nine inches of snow over the past week, but a lot of the mountains along I-70 have seen much, much more than that. And uh, there'll be some more problems, especially along and south of I-70 here tonight and tomorrow as far as the snowfall. Uh, now we're going to take a look at a sonar chart for the Denver market because of all the snow, most likely because of all the weather that's been happening here uh, over the uh, past week. Outbound tender rejections in the Denver market have increased about 3% over the past week and are now above 10%. And when outbound rejections get above 10%, that's pretty significant. You usually see spot rates start to jump above contract rates when that happens. Uh, luckily, this is going to be kind of a short-term event. And it's not really because of volumes, because the volumes haven't increased that much. It's most likely because of the weather. So I have to really keep track of what's going to be happening here in the Denver market. Uh, Freight, there should be an easier time getting freight in and out of Denver later this week after the storm is gone and once the roads are in better condition. That's a look at what's happening with your weather. Thanks for joining me, and make sure to check out all of our videos on tv.freightwaves.com and on the FreightWaves TV app. Have a great day and be careful out there.
It's Monday and that means another week of Freight Waves Now. I'm your host Anthony Smith and coming up we're going to have Luke Flaska giving us a broker update. We also have Mike Bodendistel back with us again with a rail intermodal update. But first we're going to go to the lovely Donnie Gilbert with the carrot update brought to you by Powerfleet. Stay tuned. Good morning, everybody. My name is Donnie Gilbert. I'm bringing you the Carrier Update, sponsored by Powerfleet. It's Monday. Everybody's really busy right now. Let's jump right into it. We're going to start off this morning looking at our outbound tender volumes. Uh, I brought here in the blue line is our outbound tender volumes for uh, the U.S., but this is 2020, and I've compared it to the purple line, which is 2019. Uh, looking here, we're right on line again. We've talked about this many times. Uh, our volumes dipped a little bit over the weekend, but we're following the uh, trend of 2019 very, very closely. Now, I made this map a little bit bigger today because I got a little bit excited. As you see, of course, as we get on down to the end of the month, we see volumes jump up. So right now, we're just kind of trailing along. It's first quarter. It's February, but there is a light at the end of the tunnel coming. And here we saw at the end of the month, volumes jump over to um, about 10, about 1025 or 225. So uh, we see it coming up. We just got to hang in there another couple of weeks in here. About the 23rd, it's when we started starting to see it start to pick up. Now, outbound tender rejection rates. I've brought you drive and outbound tender rejection rates. And again, I've compared it to 2019. Here we see the end of the year, we see it dropping down. We continue to drop down to 4.93%. So that's putting our spot market rates roughly kind of on the lower side of our uh, contracted rate. So, you know, when you bid contracted rates, some bid low, some bid high. So we're kind of down halfway to the lower part of contracted rates right now. So we're still trickling down. Not a good sign. When comparing to last year, uh, we're, we're kind of flattening out like we saw we, we did last year, but last year at this time we were at 7.22%. So rates are a little bit softer this year compared to February of 2019. So hopefully as we get on in, these rates will start to turn around and pick up. Before I jump into a market of the day, let's jump into a little bit of weather right quick because we have some serious conditions kind of going on here in the deep northeast. We're having some snow, ice, and of course we're having right here across this line where there's rain as well, we're having some freezing rain and icing going on. So carriers head up in the northeast, double check the weather if you're going on up into the uh, Boston area, on up in the main areas, and just make sure that um, it's going to be safe or possibly see if you can reschedule deliveries maybe for tomorrow or the next day so your drivers don't don't get stuck in there. Headed out to the uh, Midwest out here, uh, more into the western region, we have Denver and Salt Lake again. Uh, we're having some snow pickups, um, some spotty snow, snow showers going through the area today, but what happened out there over the weekend was really um, something that we need to talk about. Between Friday and Sunday, there were areas on I-70 up in the mountains that got up to 48 inches of snow near the Frisco and Breckenridge area. So those are some areas that are still uh, being uh, hurt by weather today on I-70 running through the mountains. Uh, on Friday, I believe a avalanche came down near the Frisco exit between Frisco and Copper. So uh, that's I'm sure has been clear by now, but of course it's gotten very dangerous in those areas. So uh, be mindful of this area right now. Uh, we're going to jump into the Denver market as well as my update. Over the weekend, tender rejections picked up. I got tender rejections here in red. Because of this bad weather, we have some tender rejection rates picking up. So the volumes have kind of dropped down over the weekend. And we're seeing this, and primarily we're seeing it on our uh, long haul and tweener haul. Long haul loads have jumped up to a 13.8 tender rejection rate and our tweener hauls have jumped up to 16.39. Tweener being the loads that run between 450 and 800 miles. And so a lot of these loads that might be going, maybe taking I-70 westbound, those are gonna be affected, those are gonna be rejected, which is in turn going to drive rates up. Here on the map above us, I have our, the change in tender rejection rates, uh, VOTRI, so it's drive in, and you see of course, uh, Salt Lake City, the Reno market, um, and the Denver markets are all tender rejection rates been picking up over the last week. And a lot of this has to do with the weather. So I appreciate it, guys. Thank you for tuning in. And that is our carrier update for Monday. The comprehensive logistics offerings from PowerFleet cover in-cab ELD, fleet management, trailer tracking, cargo monitoring, and tracking other assets such as chassis and intermodal containers. Power up your operations with PowerFleet.
Good morning, everyone. I'm Luke, and I'm bringing you another broker update. And happy Monday. I know Mondays are typically tough, but let's try to start off the week strong. All right, so we've got our charts here behind us, something you guys are familiar with. In blue, we've got our overall outbound tender rejection index here in the United States. So we're sitting right about just under 5.5% there in the bottom right on your screen. Pretty low from where we'd like to be, but it is flattening out. Typically speaking, this is about where we'll see the low point from this time last year around these months. So we'll see it. if it dips any lower, it might, but for the most part, this is typically where you'll start to see that flattening out from this time last year. The, uh, the orange line here is the volume level. So you can see here, we're kind of dipping a little bit lower. There's a little bit less volume to move out. We're sitting about, about 95.58 on the index scale. So again, continuing to get lower. Remember, we love to be above 10,000. When we're above 10,000, that means we're growing. When we're below it, it means that we're contracting. So again, keep an eye on that volume level. As it continues to go down, there's going to be a little bit less freight there, and it's going to be a little harder for you to capture, uh, capture extra loads from shippers that you wouldn't normally do so. So before we dive into any specific markets, we're going to take a look at our, our call map or our money map, as I like to call it. So this is our weighted rejection index. And all you really need to know here is markets that are in blue, the darker the blue means that there's typically uh, typically a little bit of tightening, meaning shippers are having a little bit more difficult time covering their freight. Now, don't get super excited just because you see a lot of dark blue here. Really, you're only talking about you know three and a half to four on the index scale. Nothing super exciting. We'd love to be in those seven, eight, nine, ten plus range. So again, we're kind of at the low end there for shippers experiencing some tightening. That being said, if you are going to make some calls today, Colorado is going to see a little bit of tightening. Salt Lake City, a little bit here in the Pacific Northwest too. You might have a little luck, especially if you're moving some reefer freight, uh, get some of that freeze protect out. So just keep eye there as you're calling around today. The market we're going to take a look at though is going to be Salt Lake City. Um, Salt Lake City, you know, a lot of peaks and valleys over here uh, since the beginning of 2020 and you're noticing that um, we kind of hit a low point there, about 5% tender rejections, and we've really popped off here over the last couple of days, sitting at about 8%. That's a good sign. So if you're moving freight, that's a really good time to increase your spot market bids on any shippers. Market's tightening. They're having a little bit more trouble covering their, their loads. So you might be able to protect yourself as carriers are going to ask for a premium as those tender rejections continue to climb there. So do keep an eye on that as you're moving freight. Well, something we're going to look at a little bit more in detail here out of Salt Lake City is some of the highest tender rejection lanes out of Salt Lake City for today. So that big one there is Salt Lake City to Seattle sitting at right at over 16% tender rejections. Might be a little hard to see on your screen, but that's 16%. Very, very high. Also, Salt Lake City to Grand Junction and Twin Falls, Idaho is going to be very high. Grand River, Denver, a lot of those markets are sitting pretty high. To take a look here, this chart down here below is the tender rejections going to Seattle from Salt Lake City. So you'll see here we're sitting at about 16%. It's really starting to push up, meaning that you can really increase your spot market bids on any freight you're moving on that lane. Um, over here is our predictive rating tool. So just to give you an idea of where pricing uh, may start to lead, we're sitting at about $1.81 today. We'll look at the median price point. That's without fuel, so be sure to add your fuel surcharge to get your all-in rate. Um, and it looks like it's going to hang out there for about a week, and then there might be a little bit of softening there as we go out about a month and three months. So do keep an eye out. So if you're trying to move freight on that lane, it might be a good opportunity to potentially uh, lock in some bids now with some shippers as you might be able to get a little bit of a premium as things start to soften a little bit down the road. So anyways, I'm Luke. That'll do it for your broker update and have a fantastic Monday. Voices from every corner of the supply chain concerning all modes of transportation. From the world's largest logistics podcast network, this is what the freight tech revolution sounds like. Freightcast presented by Freightways. Subscribe now wherever you get your podcasts. Welcome to your rail and intermodal update. I'm here with Mike Bowden Distal. Mike, what do you have for us today? So up here I have a chart of speed of oil trains um, on uh, Grand Trunk, which is owned by a Canadian National. And the reason I have, have this up here is some pretty significant news came out of Canada. The Canadian Transport Minister issued an order that all uh, trains with at least 20 cars of hazardous materials have to go no faster than 20 miles an hour or 25 miles an hour, depending on where they are. So the reason this happened 
happened was in uh, Saskatchewan, there have been two pretty significant derailments within the last two months on the same stretch of track. Uh, they want to see what's going on. So they're saying the, the oil trains you know, you need to go slower, uh, you know, also other hazardous materials, things that are flammable, petroleum and, and those type of things. So these, these train speeds are, are, are going to have to come down. This is for the next uh, 30 days, uh, started, starting on, on Saturday, although they could say it could be longer or shorter than that. Got you. And so you mentioned that this is going to affect um, those carrying those materials. Is it going to have an impact on overall movement of, of goods? I, yeah, I think it will, particularly on, on, on CN and, and CP. The, the railroads um, run a network business, and um, you know, really it's a, a single track main line over the long stretches of, of track. And so the, what, what could happen is they could be waiting for these, um, these slower uh, trains that move uh, hazardous materials to pull into a passing siding so the next train could pass. So it could have some major you know impacts when you know trains are running at at speeds that that vary uh, you know too widely so it could impact shippers that are, are not hauling anything you know not shipping anything hazardous at all you know something something like grain just because of the of the network uh, the network impacts gotcha and so next 30 days the next 30 days I mean it could be it could be longer or, or, or shorter than that um, you know CN has said that they um, are Placing a more strict uh, protocol in order to ship, you know, hazardous goods, um, and, and really an embargo is the word they use, and a notification to shippers that um, you know on you know additional hazardous materials have to get those approved. So I think it's going to be difficult to ship, you know, incremental hazardous materials if they are going to slow down the entire network. Gotcha. And what else do you have for us today? So the other thing I have today is just sort of a, a, some some thoughts following uh, Hub Group's uh, earnings last week. Right. This is the big domestic, uh, you know, intermodal, you know, company and. They provided some some guidance on the, their 2020 outlook. They said specifically they thought that um, you know intermodal volume would be up. And now, now part of that was because they're on board with the thesis that truck uh, rates are going to be higher in the second half of the year. We've heard that you know over and over again. Right. They're on board, and, and you can see why because it is so competitive right now between intermodal uh, you know rates and and and, and truck rates. Um, on the intermodal uh, pricing side, they actually said that intermodal pricing uh, you know could be you know probably down for the entirety of 2020 versus 2019. That's because uh, the, of the of the front half loaded uh, you know bid season, which takes place in the spring. The the bid season tends to follow on how market conditions were in the fall of 2019. You remember me talking about the fall of 2019 that was a muted. Yeah, muted bid season, um, you know, for, for for pricing. So you see this strong pricing in intermodal in 2019, in 2018, and, and, and it being rather weak in, in in 2019. So I think they're expecting pricing to be down a, a little bit for the entire year, comparing 2020 to 2019. Gotcha. So definitely something that's going to be impactful for shippers. Yeah, I think so. I think it's actually good news for for, for shippers because um, you know, if they're shipping intermodal, get a little bit um, of a lower price. Maybe you can lock that in. Uh, you know, if in, in the spring for the for the entirety of the year. Of course, transportation uh, contracts don't have a lot of teeth, but um, you know, the extent that, that those those rates hold, I think they get a little bit lower rate. Excellent, Mike. Thank you so much for that insight. Thank you so much as well for tuning in for this edition of Freight Waves Now. That's going to do it for our rail intermodal update, and that's going to bring us to the end of Freight Waves Now. The fun doesn't stop here. We're always posting around the clock, so check us out on all your favorite social media platforms. And don't forget about our Freight Waves TV app, where we're always streaming on all your favorite streaming platforms, including Apple TV. And for all my fellow Android users, we have you covered as well. We'll see you on the next episode. Is the trade war back on? Trade war. Trade war. Full-blown trade war. 15% tariffs on $112 billion worth of goods. Hours earlier, China announced tariffs of 5 and 10% on U.S. products.
Fountain and Distal. Yes, and what we're talking about today is uh, Badon Trucking. It's a new startup, VC backed. They have a novel approach for drop and hook programs. Um, and basically, it's, it's having the over the road drivers drive to outside the metro area. Mm -hmm. Dallas and, and Ontario, California are mm -hmm. the, the, the first markets they're going to tackle. So mm -hmm. over the road drivers going to Ontario mm -hmm. and then contracting with local, basically drayage companies mm -hmm. to, to move those those trailers in inland to, to LA, mm -hmm. uh, navigate those, those local deliveries. Mm -hmm. But it's a drop and hook program where they have real estate uh, outside of metro regions, kind of like a hub or a port, mm -hmm. where you can, as an over-the-road driver, can drop and hook. Yeah, I think on the surface this really makes a lot of sense. I mean, it really addresses some of the major issues in the trucking industry. I mean, the the, the driver, you know, retention is, is always a always a major issue, and, mm -hmm. and and part of the things that frustrates drivers the most is not getting the the great you know number of miles that that he's he is looking for, and that's gotten more difficult with yeah. things like hours of service rules and uh, greater congestion across the country. That you know the number of vehicles miles miles driven uh, always seems to exceed the number of, of lanes that are that are added, yeah. and it's just sort of of easy math gets you to uh, that's going to be worse congestion. Yeah, if you're going into LA, you're going to go in the congestion, you're going to unload, it might take you three hours, reload another three hours, so you're going to lose a day, day and a half just getting in, in delivering and picking up out of, out of LA. And that's one of the, the, the stressful things about driving is getting into these urban areas where you, you're maybe not f familiar with the city itself and certainly not, maybe not the delivery location, mm -hmm. and it's very stressful. I, I know just driving a car around, I get very stressed when I'm, yeah. whenever I'm in a strange place and trying to, to navigate with ways and, and do all that. So I think on the driver retention, I think they'll increase driver retention for the over-the-road carriers who use this type of service because yeah, their drivers are uh -huh. you know turning more miles uh -huh. and it's more I, I'd say stress-free mm -hmm. on the mm -hmm. on the highway as well yeah. as opposed to navigating city streets R right and the and the local drivers that is never the same issue with finding drivers because those guys get to go home mm -hmm. every single every night, night. Yeah. you know that's a big deal for people and just like you said I mean knowing your way around it's easier to drive someplace that you're familiar with you sort of know where you can park and mm -hmm. where the good place for lunch is and, and all those things so I think you know it, it almost seems like a win-win both for over the road and for the local the local drivers um, you know really one thing that you know causes me to, to, to think here is um, you know just really on the equipment side of the house yeah. you know often talk about you know drop and hook mm -hmm. as leading to more demand for trailers and you know if this really takes off I mean you, you would think that the uh, trailer to tractor ratio would have to increase uh, for an asset the heavy fleet it definitely would we should be bullish for trailer manufacturers mm -hmm. itself yeah guys like Wabash um, Great Dane, yeah, and uh, and guys like that. So some of the the sonar data that we have on drive times, mm -hmm. you know, HOS 11, right? There's drive time stats. It's over the road drivers about seven and a half hours a day, mm -hmm. out of their allotted 11 hours. Mm -hmm. Basically, they're they're driving and moving about seven and a half hours. Mm -hmm. uh, local guys are just under, uh, just just under five hours, mm -hmm. is their average, which blends together for about six and a half hours of average drive time for mm -hmm. for a truck driver so this this approach having these hubs outside of major metropolitan areas mm -hmm. should increase mm -hmm. uh, productivity quite a bit mm -hmm. Yeah, you would certainly think so. Um, you know, it, it also, I think, gives some of the metro areas maybe a little bit more autonomy in terms of what type of truck they want to allow in the mm -hmm. area, which is might have yeah. been what they were thinking with uh, the L.A. I'm just sort of speculating here, but, you know, L.A. is one of those cities that really wants to have, you know, cleaner air than it has mm -hmm. now with things like, uh, you know, electric trucks, CNG, those type of things. Yeah. With, with buses, you know, they, they have to be CNG in Orange County and L.A. County. So, mm -hmm. um, you know, it maybe it gives a way for the over the road guy to not you know increase his cost of doing business so much exactly. because you don't have to comply with those very strict regulations uh, in and around those those counties yeah and it definitely it cuts down on dwell times which mm -hmm. uh, the freight Intel group here at freight waves we just uh, published a report uh, it's available for passport and sonar users and we did a huge survey and research study and mathematical models or forecasts mm -hmm. of what the, the true cost of detention time is. Mm -hmm. It's quite a bit. It's over a billion dollars a year for the, the, the trucking industry. Mm -hmm. It's about $17,000 per truck per year. Wow. So if you can eliminate that, over, and that's overage of, of dwell times over two hours. 
So mm -hmm. the, we found that the average dwell time was about three and a quarter hours in our survey. Yeah. In our in, in sonar, in our wait times uh -huh. index uh -huh. that, that tracks the ELTs, it's about uh, I think 155 minutes. Okay. Which is just um, okay. Just a little over two hours. So, so in, in that 135 minutes, the driver is sitting around. The scarce resource, which is the driver, is exactly. not moving. The expensive resource, mm -hmm. which is the the tractor, is not moving. And you're typically not getting compensated no. from the shipper. I mean, sometimes there's accessorials and those type of things, but a lot of times those aren't being collected, not being billed properly, and, and, and those are still pretty big losses. But they were pretty big losses, and especially for the smaller carriers. And I was a freight broker working with a lot of smaller, and I was a smaller freight broker as well. Mm -hmm. It's it's difficult to get those detention fees from your customers a lot of times. Yeah. And it, when you do get them, they're going to be delayed. The driver's not going to get paid or the carrier's mm -hmm. not going to get paid for a couple, three, four weeks mm -hmm. uh, until you collect that money. And basically the, the carrier and the broker and the shipper spend a lot of time negotiating these, these yeah. fees that uh, really don't, it's just really a a pain in the neck a lot yeah, of times yeah. and, and this another thing that our survey showed here look at my notes is that the average quote for a carrier for detention times and that's over that two hour mark is fifty five dollars mm -hmm. and about forty five percent of that quoted price actually gets paid on okay average. okay right mm -hmm. so you know you're sitting there for maybe three four hours uh, for your your pickup and delivery days that, that you do that and you're losing you're losing money you're only getting paid maybe thirty dollars an hour mm -hmm. for that mm -hmm. overage which is mm -hmm. you know it's a waste and an inefficiency in the trucking industry yeah 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 that's, well, that's great we're looking forward to learning more about this company as it develops i'm completely yeah, you know uh, interested to see where their facility is and you know dallas theory i'm very familiar with uh, I, I, I am too I, I i'm familiar with dallas too so it'd probably be Kind of on the northwest side, I yeah. would imagine. Yeah, it's certainly would, not in Dallas itself. Right. right? I, would, I would sort of speculate maybe it's in like a like a Denton, which yeah, it would Denton. be sort of at the northern part of the Dallas Fort Worth metro mm -hmm. area, maybe just before the traffic starts to get bad, closer yeah. to DFW. But but we'll see. I mean, interested to learn more. Yeah, same here. So um, check out the article on FreightWaves.com and to see our FreightWaves freight intel report on detention times, uh, sign up for Sonar or subscribe or Sonar or Passport. They're available for, for each. And that wraps it up for this episode of Freight Update. Voices from every corner of the supply chain concerning all modes of transportation. From the world's largest logistics podcast network, this is what the freight tech revolution sounds like. Freightcast presented by FreightWaves. Subscribe now wherever you get your podcasts. And welcome to this week's Great quarter, guys. My name's Kevin Hill. I have Andrew Cox over here in his normal seat, just back from the Bahamas, a nice little cruise. It's lucky that he did actually get back. You didn't get uh, quarantined, no quarantine. in, in the, the Caribbean for like three weeks. That's not the worst place to be quarantined. Uh, it wouldn't be, no. Uh, they did take off some passengers that, that had been to China in the last two weeks, so there was a bit of an, an impact from the coronavirus, but uh, nothing major. Wow. You look healthy. You, you, you're glowing. Thank you. It wasn't very sunny down there. I got a lot of a lot of sun through the oh, really? through the clouds. Yeah, we only had like one sunny day. Everything else was pretty cloudy. Well, but you're probably in the bar then. It was warm. Time anyway. uh, I was. Yeah, but they got <laughs> bars outside too. So it's true. <laughs> and our special guest here, JB Hampstead, JP Hampstead. My P's sound like bees. They tell me so. JP Hampstead. Thanks for having me. Yeah, great. Back again. What's up? I man? know, right? So an another great episode of Great Quarter Guys. We are going to talk about one of the hottest stocks right now, which is Tesla. Oh, yeah, I think Tesla is one hottest. is probably the hottest it's stock. Yeah. It's, it's up how much over the last week? I mean, it's doubled. Uh, it was yeah, doubled this year. One hundred and twenty percent year to date. So year last, to date, three weeks. Yeah, four weeks or four weeks. Mm -hmm. We're from February now, aren't we? Yeah, February. I, I still think today. we're in middle January. Yeah, time moves uh, fast. It, it does, doesn't it? Yeah, I mean, today alone, it's gone up like sixteen percent or yeah. something. It was up twenty percent yesterday. I mean, that's that's just crazy. Yeah, it is crazy. So we are going to cover Tesla, and then we're going to go into a couple other things. We're going to talk about, of course, the the, the forecast of twenty twenty, and kind of what FreightWave said thinks uh, is going to happen in the trucking market. A little bit of DHL supply chain pricing power index mixed in there. And then we're going to do our long and shorts. 
But first, we're going to tackle Tesla. And um, and as always, our friends over at Carrier Direct, Peter and Ryan and Diane, supplied a lot of the research, the stock research that, that we're going to go into uh, very, very quickly. And, um, yeah, so special thanks again to Carrier Direct. Yeah, I think this is going to be fun. You, you got, I think we got two bears in the room and, and one bull. Well, I don't uh, know what JP is, actually. I think, I think JP's a bear. Uh yeah, okay, let's just run down some big ones. Their market cap has exploded uh, up to $160 billion now. The and most that's valuable as of like car today, company in the right? world. Yeah, that's as of like a couple minutes ago. Mm, okay. Um, so, yeah, now the most uh, valuable car company in the world, like four times more valuable than Ford uh, in the U.S. Um, they had 2019 revenues, about $25 billion. Uh, I think I think revenues in the fourth quarter were 75 or something. Uh, so up <clears throat> the fourth quarter revenues were the highest of any quarter this year. Uh, again, yeah, stock's up 120% year to date. Um, we can dive into the revenues a little bit. Their, their total revenues were up 15% year over year, and uh, their costs were down, so they, they came out cash flow positive for the last three quarters. Uh, they actually had net income this last quarter. Uh, and a lot of their reasons for the, for the, for the revenues being uh, up less than the uh, everything else but I think they had a higher mix of, of Model 3s so they sold uh, more cars they had 400,000 deliveries this year so, so, so correct me if I'm wrong this is a car company that's valued at six times revenue I don't think it's a car company no I think we I think do we they get, not make cars they make cars they, make, they do a lot of other things I think they have you ever seen a Tesla driving down the road yes they make cars is Apple a watch company well they I mean, sell more watches than anyone else Anyone else or anyone else in the any watch company in the world, Apple sells more. Do they really? Yeah. They took over Rolex like two years ago. Wow. I didn't mm-hmm. even think that Apple Watch had been out for two years. Yeah, they sell more watches than anyone else. I think they're well on their way to selling more um uh, pods or whatever, you know, ear, yeah, ear, ear, ear pods. Ear pods than anyone else as well. But but what is Apple? I don't even know if they're if they're not a watch company, what are they? I, I mean, mean they're a technology I guess they're a company. Tech company. Yeah, they're a tech tech company. That sells they, they make computers. Well, I mean, they're they're differentiated because they're the only um, like computer manufacturer that also designs the operating system and builds like you know a lot of the whatever like the software as well as the hardware. I like Google does it as well now. They they took over. They bought HTC. They're now building their own phones. They got the Pixel. You know, what is Google? Uh, Google's a tech company. Yeah. Are they advertising company? They're an, or adver- are they, they're an advertising company. Are they a search company. I don't know. That's is, this is a really good question, actually, because what is uh, what is anybody? Uh, yeah, that's just so, like, so. What I is think, Tesla? I think we wa- I think we waste too much time trying to box them in to these like predetermined industries that we have. For the only reason is to so we can compare them to other people. But mm-hmm. there's no one really that we can comp Tesla to directly. There's a lot of other people that we can try to comp them to. We can try to comp them to Toyota or Honda or Ford or other car companies. I think Honda's the only one that makes sense there because they're the only ones that make a lot of other things besides cars. They make solar. They got into solar panels. They make mm-hmm. engines for leaf blowers and lawnmowers. What do you think? Te- what do you think Tesla's uh, solar panel business should be valued at? Oh, I don't know. I don't know any other solar panel panel business. Well, the investors say zero. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but, so I mean, here, here's my thing. thing. Here's my thing. Like, I don't want to get into like okay. a pedantic debate about whether they're a tech company or a car company because that doesn't really matter. But my my point here would be that the reason why tech companies enjoy rich multiples is because they have high quality recurring revenue um, and they have g- gross margins that get better and better the more they sell. So if I write a program like Microsoft Office and every copy, you know, I, I incur millions of dollars paying people to, ma- you know, make the, the source code, right? Mm-hmm. But then every, um, every subsequent copy of the software that I sell has better and better gross margins. So more and more of that is profit. That isn't the case with car companies, which is why I think that, uh, you know, and, and it's not the case, and regardless of whether you think you know, well, Tesla's a car company or not, where they get their revenue is by selling giant pieces of metal um, cars. Well, software companies have, have, have uh, gigantic economies of scale, right? Because you have that initial investment, and then you just have basically maintenance of, let's say, the code or rolling out new features. So you get that huge incremental margin. Right, and and as you said, you know, building cars is, is a very capital intensive business. So it really, so, so it comes it's down harder to, to get to those economies of scale. So yeah, so economies of scale, the kind of revenue, whether it's one time or recurring, um, 
and the the way that the gross margins behave as the company mm-hmm. reaches scale and as more of the product is sold yeah. that that's those characteristics of the revenue are why tech companies are valued so highly um and that's that's kind of like you know obviously tesla makes very high tech cars but fundamentally May, every Model Three that they make costs about as much as the the previous Model Three that they made. So that's that's kind of yeah, like you why limit, I think uh, I think that it should be treated differently. Not, I mean, if they do get recurring revenue off of software, if they are able to, um, you know, build cars and then have robo taxis or something like that, obviously that revenue should be valued differently. But like in in the current like, if you look at their financial statements, like. I don't see why, to me, um, the company is valued so highly. But Andrew is just back from the Caribbean. He's writing notes. He really wants to say something, and I cut him off just now. I'll probably cut you off again. But I want to hear what you think. Yeah. No, it was my, my, my rebuttal was, so you, right now we've determined two things that make a company a tech company. One is economies of scale. That you, can, uh, you, can, you can build off of every, every product that you make that has a better margin than the previous one. Right. And recurring revenue. Are those, are those are only two prerequisites for a tech company. Well, I wouldn't say they're the only two prerequisites. It's it what it makes the valuation of a tech company that much more than someone than Ford or GM, right? I mean, that's that's one of the, the key ingredients. Yeah, right. Uh, and again, I would say that the the I mean, if another factor, I guess, would kind of be that like modern tech companies, especially the highly valued ones, try to do something that previous companies haven't done before, whether. Whether it's Google, whether it's Facebook, whatever, connecting people in a different way, searching the internet, leveraging the data for all different kinds of businesses in a different way, um, you're not you're not going to see a company, for example, go public and say, "Hey, we are going to build." To use my previous example, we're building the next word processing program. Like we're we're launching we're launching you know instead of Microsoft Office, you know FreightWaves Office, and that's going to be like. Well, I'll, I'll and, let Andrew rebut. Re- 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 is your re- point is one. your point that Tesla is is doing that, or they're do, they're doing something that people have done previously? Well, it's like basically like it's this it's a product that already exists that's already in a highly competitive. It's well, a car. I mean, it's it's a different kind of car though. So I'll take Andrew's side on this one because I, you know, I it, it's a different kind of car. It's a different philosophy. It's a different manufacturing process, and that's the dream. And 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 I like Teslas. I think they're they're gorgeous cars. I'd like to have one. Um, but but my thing is that's the dream. That's the vision. Now the, the valuation right now, especially, is to that vision. But can they execute that? Yeah, I'm not arguing that the valuation isn't super rich right now. I'm mm-hmm. not. That's. <laughs> That's well, it's gone up. I mean, the and, thing's doubled in the last. And, and who was it? Was three John weeks. Barron that came out, uh, a famous money manager, Perma Bull, who came on CNBC uh, actually this morning. And that's one of the reasons why the stock's up 15% and said that in 10 years he thinks it's a trillion dollar revenue. a year revenue company, right. which is so outlandish that. But why is that outlandish? What do you think that? What's the, uh, so the $25 rev- billion dollars this year. So in 10 years, I mean, I mean, I'm not. That good at math. Yeah, but I, don't, I think yeah. his argument wasn't that they're going to take. I mean, it's like thousands exponential growth. Right, but I don't think his argument is that that all of that revenue growth is going to come from car sales. I, I think the, I think that, I think eventually they get to a point where they look at look at Apple now. So Apple, mm-hmm. they when the iPhone came out, it grew exponentially. It became you know 60 70 80% of their revenue and then they started divesting away from that and getting into services they started building attachments to things mm-hmm. and now now apple revenue well, I, less than 50% actually comes from iphones i think tesla's going to do the same thing and they've already started building re- recurring revenue models well, that they, they will have take the vision, over the service they, they have the vision of the th- same thing right you just have to execute it right and you know steve jobs for you know all his uh, up and down up and down kind of unique personality didn't get in so much trouble with the SEC, didn't get so much trouble with investors, didn't get in, you know, does, does I, Elon I Musk Tesla have investors the... investors are pretty happy right now. Well, they're, they're happy right now. They, they weren't happy six months or nine months ago, 12 months ago. But, but you know, it's, it's short term. Ten years away, a trillion dollars in revenue is a little bit outlandish. Well, That's uh, an outlandish call. Yeah, to say, a trillion oh, dollars in revenue is outlandish it. because it's, it's just simply, like, never been close to... Yeah, being done like so. ever but but like 
I'm not saying it can't happen. I'm just saying I think it's outlandish. Also, I think it's. Outlandish. I think it's I kind of. I kind of think that a lot of the run up in the valuation right now is because I mean, and you're seeing it in the other weird companies too. You look at something like, like uh, Virgin Galactic has gone up a lot. Like kind of a weird like risk on tech company. Would yeah. that be uh, SpaceX? Virgin Virgin Galactic Space. 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 Yeah, yeah. Virgin Galactic. Richard Branson's uh, Space Tourism Company. I I think I've heard of them. Which is pre ripped. Once or twice. um, Every day before eight thirty in the morning. (laughs) (laughs) But yeah, not a not a not I don't have a position in space. Uh, but um I I think a lot like people have been excited about Tesla for a long time and but there have been like a lot of negative headlines about it so i think that you know you've got the the sec investigation the blade manipulate you know blade and stock manipulation falling falling the, back on production you numbers the bad, constantly yeah like that yeah. To, you know well, and, issues uh, issues with quality issues with with autopilot all all the different things everyone knows about i'm not going to rehearse for you know and, and bore everyone but it's like i think there was a lot of people wanted in but there were all these lingering clouds, I think some of those have dissipated and have allowed really like the true, like crazy enthusiasm of the retail investor base to come through. I don't, but I mean, I think anyone who's like says they know why the stock is, has doubled so quickly. Like, no, I mean, I think I know what the stock has doubled. It's FOMO. It's pure fear of missing out on this big run. I saw the same thing uh-huh. in crypto end of 2017, beginning of 2018. You just have people that are seeing it go up and they don't know why. Nobody can explain it, but they know they want in. So they just buy and buy and buy and they buy it up. Like tulips. Ha- like tulips. Like tulips. Uh, it's, it's, it's Similar, exactly, but you know, in a very can't short... It, you can't increase the production of electric cars as quickly as you can increase the production of tulips. I, I don't think so. <laughs> but I, I don't know. I've never grown tulips, so I, I really can't tell you for certain. <laughs> um... But yeah, the, there's the, there's well, you know, how, one, how, one of the things right before you know is is another worry that I have on Tesla is these promises they make that are a little bit outlandish. But they're promises like a million by the end of this year, a million autonomous. I think it was twenty twenty one. Yeah, twenty twenty one. Yeah. Well, even that. Well, you, is, you realize they already have the taxis on the road. Well, it, but a million of them. Yeah, they've already sold a I mean, million they, cars. They, it's just an it's just a well, software upgrade. How to many their own did car. they sell? How many cars did they sell? They had 400,000 deliver- deliveries this year. This year. So not tw- this quarter, but this year. 115. 115. So they're going to double production. Yeah, and they are, they're, planning to, they're planning to deliver 500,000 cars next year. And all those are going to be autonomous Yeah, it's just a software upgrade. They're already. They're already. They have the FSD full service driver. It's, it's not that I simple. Don't know. It's, it, of it, course, it, they have regulatory approval to get through. But no, but it, 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 it's not the case that all of the Model Threes even have um, the hardware necessary for for full self driving. Like there are different people who have like tried to upgrade who can't and things like that. Like it's not. It's not simply a, a software issue. There's there's very complicated um, large computers that are required. I mean that that are already in. Tesla's to some degree, but I don't think they can just over over the air like retrofit every Tesla that's ever made, ever been made w- with with like autonomous taxi capabilities. And, and I don't know any software company that that does that correctly. They, okay, we're going to update a million cars on the road. Nothing's going to go wrong. Oh, right? again, I mean, not, I don't that's, think that's, it's, I don't think it's a I don't think Tesla's making the choice. I think you have to pay. So again, it's another you pay two thousand dollars. Any kind so of upgrade, it's not going to be a million at a you time. You know, if, if we take Microsoft as an example, right? Every time they come out with new Windows, it's a, a perfect product, right? It's it's no, it's full of holes and bugs and fixes, and it takes like twelve to eighteen months well, just to sort it out. Let's let's talk which about which is not a bad thing. I mean, that's that's how you do business. Um, let's talk of about. Course, Putting it, stakes putting software yeah. in, in the stakes are much higher. Yeah, I want to hear Andrew talk about like a bullish theme. What what's going on with the Gigafactory three in in Shanghai or Gigafactory two? Oh no, 2? no, they're building the Model threes in Shanghai. They're yeah, but the first deliveries. Yeah, well, so the, whatever whatever number the the factory is oh, in, oh. in Shanghai, like oh, the sorry. Gigafactory two or whatever. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah, gotcha. What's the potential for that market? Like, how important is China to Tesla's future? Well, I think China's immensely important, as important, uh, probably more important. Oh, than, there's no way to get a trillion North dollars America. without China. No, there's no way without China. Um, no, I think I think Tesla's. I think I think uh, China is of vital importance to Tesla. One, they the the production capacity is expected to be I think 150,000 by the end of 2020. Uh, they'll 
likely meet that capacity and demand. They sold, uh, I want to say like 30 or 40, they delivered 30 or 40,000 in China. Um, this is the first year they started delivering in China. Uh, 2019 was, excuse me. In 2019, those were mostly going built in California and Correct. shipping them. Okay. Correct. So, you know, you, you, uh, beyond the tariffs currently that are on, um, imported cars from the U S once they're built in China, you not only, you know, can negate that cost, uh, but, Everybody knows that everything's cheaper to build in China, that we don't have to get into that. Um, and you have a mat, like the Chinese market's the biggest car market. It's the biggest um, electric, oh, like, oh, electric be, car market. Uh, by far, um, yeah. It's, you know, and it's it's also, there's a massive population. Like, the thing about the 1% in China, you know, we talk about the 1% in the U.S. being so much. I mean, mm -hmm. it's five times as big in China. So um, there's plenty of people that can afford them. People, Tesla has that kind of almost like Nike status uh, as a brand oh, over there. So I think people demanded I, I think and then on top of that you've you, you, once they get into the autonomous and the robo taxis and everything else uh there's a big market for there that for there as well i mean so ch ch china's you, a massive where, market so i i under, i do understand that china is like the largest market for electric vehicles in the world right now um i'm can you help us understand sort of where tesla fits into the competitive landscape in terms of evs in china like i would imagine that the current dominant models are not as nice and much cheaper mm -hmm. so this is going after like the people who would normally be buying like mercedes benzes and stuff like yeah that. i would think i think there's a little bit of both i think that they can make model threes there cheap enough that yeah they won't be able to to, to compete with the tatas or all of the really cheap you know just <laughs> plastic models that, that are driven around there but i think yeah i think they fit there as china as china's income grows as as people become more wealthy in in china tesla will be uh, a status symbol for a lot of people in China. So that yeah. brings up the question, isn't that uh, an issue that Apple's always had with Asia, especially in China, is that uh, they don't own the market share at all in China. It's Android, which are sh cheaper, cheaper devices that work just as well as the, the status of an iPhone. And that's always been a little bit of a stumbling block for, for Apple is... is is having consumers in Asia that can meet that price point. Yeah, well, Apple has a Apple has a problem there because they've not been willing to accept the demands of the Chinese government for them to, uh, to for them to get in that market there. The Huawei, OnePlus, there's a dozen companies over there that dominate the phone market that but, aren't American but, made; they're well, Chinese made. And it's kind of the, the same in Latin America, though, right? If you look at international Android phones, or oh yeah, they have a much, they have a much better more mark, market, market share, share. Yeah, yeah, mainly because of the price. Right? Yeah, I'd say okay. for the price. Yeah. Uh, and for the fact that the things that we like about Apple phones, uh, you, they're not really necessary in other countries. A lot of other people, yeah. are, they just use WhatsApp. You can use WhatsApp yeah. on, on but, any But do you device. think Tesla might have that same uh, stumbling block or, or roadblock? But let's say that they can bust through it, but uh, they're, they're going to have that same issue with price points in Asia. And, and having that premium built into their price, that, that Nike or, or Apple status. Well, I think... The risk I mean, it's is, going to be a challenge. Yeah, I think the risk is there, and we can we can go back and forth on companies that have that have jumped well, over the. I'm no, not no, no. saying they can't. No, no, I know, I know. I'm just saying, I, you know, we could go back and forth on who mm -hmm. has been able to jump over the block and who hasn't been able to get over it. Uh, but I think Tesla, because of the brand they've established, and and on personally, Elon Musk's likely likeness in Asia, people love him in Asia. So mm -hmm. I think just the fact that they're Again, they're, it's a it's a company that's becoming richer every day. They're having more disposable income. It's almost they they it's a very oh, status yeah. heavy uh, war, status heavy culture as well. There, there's no question about all so of those I things. Think, here. Uh, yeah, there's I, I no think I think they'll be able to jump over that. And block. I think I, I think do. his and especially they'll be able to cheap they'll be able to sell them at a cheaper price than they do anywhere else in the world. The ones that are built there in the Shanghai factory, the, the Model Threes there are going to be cheaper than anywhere else. So. I, I, I think, think his fun. his brand also translates internationally pretty well. Like the the themes about um, well, he's electrification, too. you know, electrification, the, electrification, space exploration are things that kind of are like global concerns. That um, I think you know when people when, when de in developing countries people can start to afford to care about those things, they do. Mm -hmm. um, I'll, I'll be interested to see how they build out like the network of. Uh, charging infrastructure, the way that they distribute cars and the logistics behind that. I know they've had some, you know, just kind of issues with deliveries and things like that in the U.S. and obviously China's a whole other world. I don't really know. I, I suspect they'll sell mostly to the, the coastal cities you know, on the East Coast. Yep, definitely. Um, but 
yeah, I mean, it's it's obviously like the, the the honestly, China is one of the reasons why I can see people kind of saying the stock has a really big upside that's kind of hard to measure. Well, I mean, do you mean I, the thing about China is that they don't have to uh, Tesla itself doesn't have to build out a charging network like it does in the U.S. China, the Chinese government is already building has already built out a massive uh, network there. I think in Shanghai alone last year they put in more um, in the city of Shanghai more um, more charging stations in that city than in the entire U.S. did in the last two or three years. So I mean they're just they're exponentially wow. growing their network. They're they're trying to get a, to get ahead of this electrification you know curve. Uh, I think that's one of China's themes moving forward is, is that this is how they're going to try to take over the number one spot of the world is electric cars and AI and everything forward, military power. But I think it's part of their plan. And that's a and risk, Tesla too. fits in well there. It's a risk, too. It's an opportunity and a risk, right? Because of the same reason uh, it's a kind of a risk for for Apple or any other right. technology vendor uh, because of the state politics. You yeah, know, you, don't wanna get, you don't want to get communism, but... Rip up, up you, you, and looked at yeah. as like a tool of the American government, or and like, get crowded out by by right. cheaper, or get copied, and then get pushed off, get copied by a space a state sponsored mm-hmm. uh, institution, and then get pushed off. But on on, on, but, on that, so I mean that's that's just risks, and every company faces it, which is, which is fine, right? But it's another another reason why the trillion dollars is is going to be very hard. Yeah, I, the tr- I keep on going back to trillion dollars, but. Yeah, uh, there's no reason. Yeah, for it's me a, to. it's a crazy number, but uh, it, you know. it is. all right. Well, how about this? I got a question for you guys. Uh, what do you think? What company should Tesla strive to be? We talked earlier about how it's hard to comp them to anyone that there's no real direct pure play, uh, sustainable energy company. But this seems to be close to one, uh, close to as we're going to get to one right now. Who should who should uh, Tesla strive to be? Should they strive to be something like Apple that has a lot of hardware but also sells a lot on software? Or they should they try to be Honda, who's known for uh, for incredible engineering power, like, well, who should they strive to be? I, I like, think they're striving to be both. Yeah, I like your analogy to Apple or, earlier in this show because that makes so much sense. Is that you you build very well designed hardware products that are can be a platform for services and software, and it's a, sort of an integrated pleasurable experience, user experience that's like second to none. And you charge way more than everyone else, but it's viewed as like a must-have kind of item. Like if they can if they can get to that, then uh, you know the company should be very valuable. Um, again, whether they'll get to Apple's you know net earnings, who knows? But um, the, you know they're still in the business of making cars, and they're they're in you know the in the in China is a, a country with much better public transportation than you know for, for example the U.S. East Coast. So um, so let's talk about electric trucks because they they came out with news on their the, earnings the semis, about uh, the, the semis okay. right not the cyber trucks mm-hmm. but the semis uh, that they they said they're going to start production and deliver yep deliver limited these volumes limited volumes second in, half this year of this year mm-hmm. where are they going to make those uh, I think they're, they're made in free free uh, Fremont isn't it yeah whatever okay. their California factory is have they made Fremont. any yeah yeah there's there's been prototypes running all over the prototypes, roads they've seen but, them but not full scale uh, I don't think they've done I don't okay. think they've begun full full scale right. production yet it'll be a good it'll be a good indicator of, of their, actually, their technology or their manufacturing capabilities some of them have actually be been to. um spotted uh in testing like yeah. delivering other Tesla cars to dealerships but, like so pulling this, trailers okay. and stuff um but by getting up to full, I mean, full scale pr- production is something that they've always struggled with. So we'll see if they still struggle with both the, but I will, the, I will, the semi-trucks and the cyber trucks if they actually are going to produce those. I will I, make I the know. argument that they're, most of their bottlenecks uh, in, in prior years have come from battery production. And that was all before the, gig, the, the Gigafactory in Arizona or wherever the hell it is. Uh, Nevada, was built, right? Nevada was built. Reno, yeah. Uh, hey, I saw them building that one, one time whenever I was out in, really? in Reno working. Yeah, yeah. Um, it's huge. The thing that, huge. The thing that I, I think will be, you know, well, I think the thing that I think will keep the semi from being like a major contributor to the company's bottom line is basically just that, it, like, Commercial, like uh, trucking companies, for example, really care about asset utilization. They really care about downtime for maintenance. Um, and they're not going to have people who know how to fix these trucks. On the one hand, electric vehicles and electric drivetrains should be much more reliable mm-hmm. than internal combustion cars. 
but we do know about you know i mean just put you know putting a hundred thousand miles a year on on a truck on a brand new truck yeah you don't know never, what the wear and tear yeah is, like is gonna be things like. are going to break um you know it's it's they're, a, they're just now learning how to build these trucks no one knows how to fix them and tesla itself right. isn't great at quickly turning around those cars and getting them back on the road so, so I, I think that's one of the problems too is that the the, the semi trucks might be a distraction kind of like space is a distraction uh boring a tunnel through la and what other businesses that elon musk is is doing right now are distractions so basically the semi market is never going to be the 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 anything that really moves the needle for for tesla at the moment right yeah, well, yeah. so so you, you're devoting a lot of resources to, to chase a market that do you really need to chase should you really perfect the electric are they car, really are they really putting car? that much resources to it though they're only they're only spending five percent on on r d yeah but that's, that's that's still a lot that's still just a lot of people doing something that doesn't really need to be done you kind of need laser focus well i mean do you do you argue that the that the market for semis in the next fifteen to twenty years is going to change change like change to a big degree it's I, I, go I, I away think from it will but, but at some point you can't do everything you got to the 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 riches are where the niches, or the niches are the riches, and if you try to do everything, I, I think that 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 is very tough to do. It's just very tough to do. Getting into semis, getting into all kinds right. of these businesses that distract your attention because you only have so much time. Yeah, but he's somehow got more time than most other people. <laughs> like that dude works like 150 <laughs> I, hours a he week. He does, and there's there's no no doubt that that he does. Um, but I think over time those distractions might catch up. Uh, to the business, and it kind of did about a year or so ago. You know, they're going in a tough space, it, or, or tough space, um, where he's fighting with the the the, the SEC. You know, yeah, he, yeah. It was making, a stupid tweet. I mean, let's, well, let's, let's but, not but, argue. But I don't think he really cares at this moment because he's he's. Well, I, I mean, know, he owns eighteen percent of Tesla. At this moment, he doesn't. But now he's not chairman of the board. He's got yeah, lawsuits he's not from investors. Anywhere. He's. I know he's not going anywhere, but. They're just more distractions, and in in the future, less power that he does have over over the, his business Tesla. And the other the other thing that I'm waiting for to see, kind of in the the, the income statements, is that um, w w with especially with regard to the semi, is still waiting for capital expenditures to exceed depreciation. Um, that, that that's been it's been running under depreciation for I want to say four quarters now. Mm -hmm. um, I think this quarter just, maybe they they did. I don't. Finally, I don't think so. I don't no. think so. I, um, I don't think that's going to happen anytime soon. Especially now. I don't know if you know they changed their lease um, their lease agreements for anybody that's leasing a Model Three from them. You no longer get to keep it at the end of your lease, or uh, you don't have the option to buy it. The Tesla gets it back. So I think they're going to have Tesla's going to own more and more cars. So I don't know if they're like they're going to be depreciating those cars. Over time, I don't know when that may happen, but it might not happen anytime soon. CapEx exceeding depreciation. I what think are they going to do with the cars? They're going to dedicate them to robo taxis. What do you mean? Okay. okay. Probably not. I mean, it's going to take it's going to take time. It'll be next yeah. year, next year, the year after. But yeah. So the robo taxis are supposed to come out by the end of 2021. Yeah. They, well, yeah. He's, he's expecting quite a few by the end of 2021. But he said in a in a in a in a a pr presentation or something not too long ago that he'll have that there will be some running in some jurisdictions by the end of this year because okay. uh, there are some places in arizona and even pittsburgh there's been some some cities that with have, no human drivers yeah no human drivers so so but but the, they the, they tend musk does this yeah, he over promises he over promises and under delivers quite often yeah but so he we'll over promises see. to such a degree that people are okay with the <laughs> okay with the results typically. true true but it does yeah. affect the stock price in, in the short term uh which it's been a volatile stock there's been a lot of drama there were a couple of times when they were very very short on cash a couple of times mm -hmm. when the stock was low enough mm -hmm. that he was about to get margin called but it's crazy that they keep like I mean, it's been, that's why it's been such a fun story. That's why it's, I think, maybe the over, uh, ins over promises. inspired so much energy from both his supporters and detractors is just that they keep managing to throw these Hail Marys and thread the needle quarter after quarter. And, um, I mean, obviously now the market thinks that a lot of, like I said, a lot of storm clouds have cleared and that they're turning things around. Um, 
yeah, we'll, we'll see. It's, it's obviously, yeah. it's been, it's been very fascinating. And I, I do want to say that like for all of my criticisms of the company, um, and the way it's run and its valuation, like I'm not someone who would ever want it to go bankrupt. Like, I think if you, you know, if you're, che if you're cheering for the bankruptcy of like, and I'm not talking about you, Kevin, or any, but, but there's obviously an active community of people on Twitter, like te the Tesla Q people who like want to think it should be bankrupt, and, want to be bankrupt. And like, Bloomberg Business Week, I think it was two weeks ago, had a, a, an excellent article on those guys that Tesla. Yeah, Dana, Dana Hall wrote that. I follow yeah, her on yeah, Twitter. Yeah, yeah, yeah buy, she's great. It's called Buy Haters on Bloomberg. If oh, you're interested yeah, in, if you're interested yeah, yeah. In, in Tesla and and what the short sellers are saying and what they're doing and the Twitter wars and and how Elon Musk is singling him personally singling out people in this yeah, group yeah. like you know another it's distraction it's, it's been know? intense but i think like if you really want like <laughs> one of the one of the only recently founded american car companies to go bankrupt like that's there's something wrong with you like yeah, you, yeah you there's should, something i you like, know i'm a bear on the stock i i think they have a lot of challenges to execute and be successful, but I would still like to buy a Tesla three or a new Tesla, uh, whatever they come out. Except the Cybertruck, no Cybertruck. But <laughs> anything else, I'd be a, a huge fan to, to drive. I've never r even ridden one. I, I hear it's. I've, I've, I've ridden in one that was being d driven somewhat erratically uh, <laughs> through the streets of Chicago. V great acceleration. Gr yeah. Great acceleration. I'll, I'll, I'll just I'll, just, I'll leave it at that. I was being pushed into the, into the, my seat several times. It was it was, a, it was a thrilling ride. Nice, nice. So I I hope they do well. I, I think that they have a, a great product. I, I think they can hit on all of these, but it's going to be very very difficult to execute on everything he's trying to do. And there's probably more, much more stumbling blocks ahead for them before they actually reach that vision. So. I'll leave it at that and turn it over to you. Yeah, I mean, uh, I'm a very long on Tesla. I probably will buy a Tesla if my Toyota Camry will last me a couple more years <laughs> so I can save up some money. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, but, yeah, I, I think, and this is, I mean, all, everything we've said, and they haven't even started producing the Model Ys yet. That's mm -hmm. likely going to be their best-selling car. I mean, that's the best-selling car in America is across their SUV. They're growing popularity in China. So, I, yeah, I think there's very bright days. There's probably a couple dark days ahead of him. I'm sure Elon Musk will do something stupid uh, and tweet while he's drunk. But I think I think there's bright days ahead. I, I think know. it's by far going to be the, the most very valuable good. car company for a long time. Very good. Well, that's cool. uh, that's the end of the segment for for Tesla. Thanks again to Carrier Direct for providing a lot of this great research that we just have our fingertips every every morning uh, that we can come in here and and discuss. Uh, different stocks and different financial plays in the market. And JP, thanks for being here. You can stay if you want to, or you can get back out and, and, and do some work. It's up, really up to you. Got it. Got some stuff. Like I'm gonna finish up, but uh, thanks for having me, yeah, guys. Get the work. Get, yeah. It. yeah. Uh, get that passport research out there. Yes. Yes. And you can find all of JP's research at FreightWaves.com/passport, and that's all the information that you need to sign up for, for that product, which includes his research, our research, mm -hmm. plus event tickets, all in one package that gets you through 12 months. That's right. Yeah. So what's the next next thing on our agenda, Andrew? Uh, next thing is actually one of those research projects, our 2020 freight forecast. We we're just going to talk a little bit about what we're expecting. Uh, we'll go ahead and sh give a shout out now. You can go ahead and download. That's one of our, our free uh, research reports. You can download it on FreightWaves.com. Yeah, just Google 2020 FreightWaves for or no, I'm sorry, 2020 FreightWaves uh, Freight Outlook. And it will take you directly to the download page. You can download that free report. It's a, a special report that our paid research divisions have put out online. Plus, we we shot a live live show within the booth. Dooner, myself, JP was on there. Uh, Bot and Soul was on there talking about intermodal. Uh, we also, uh, Craig Fuller, our CEO, came on with JT Ingstrom, our, our chief strategy officer, and we all uh, came in and discussed what we're seeing in the markets and what we're expecting for the next 12 months. That's right, and you can watch that uh, FreightWaves TV. So it's tv.freightwaves.com. You can check mm -hmm. that live stream out. Um, yeah, I mean, do we do we want to jump into some of the numbers? Or you want to you want to move on to the DHL supply chain? Well, let's uh, let's move on to the DHL supply chain, and then we'll we'll ex extrapolate Talk that out, out cool. 
for for 2020 because that's the the DHL supply chain pricing power index is is a real time market condition. So what are we seeing right now? Uh, so the the pricing power fell a little bit uh, this mm-hmm. week. Fell five points towards the shippers. Uh, just a quick refresher: zero would be all the power to the shippers. One hundred, all the power to the carriers. Fifty fifty is, a, is an even market both ways. Uh, so it's fallen down from it was at forty five a, a month ago or so. Uh, it's fallen down to thirty now. Um, and our reasons for that, I guess we saw volumes were pretty much identical to last year, uh, except for the reefer volumes. They're they're up uh, yeah, the pretty re- sharply. Yeah, the reefer volumes are up, and we had some pretty bleak earnings yeah. all through throughout, the week, the last couple load, of weeks. Logistics, you know, it's not company specific; it's just the market. Mm-hmm. Everyone's down. Revenues are down fifteen percent, ten percent, five percent, mostly double digits though in both um, both the, like dry van, flatbed. And also brokerage, too, has taken an enormous hit on both gross revenues and net revenues, and that margin has shrank because we're in that part of the cycle where contract rates are still coming down, uh, spot rates are, are flat, mm-hmm. uh, and if when they start moving up, it's going to get probably another quarter of, of really bleak earnings, especially on the logistics side, as that gross margin narrows. Uh, until we rebalance and, and, and hit the next phase of the, the freight brokerage cycle. Right. And that's that's when spot rates kind of push up contract rates during those renegotiations. Exactly. And so you have that spread is a bit wider for those logistics and brokers uh, to, to make some money. You do. Uh, but in, even in that, right before that happens, uh, your margins will narrow a little bit, but the, the, the gross or the, the average revenue uh, per load will start to increase. So even though you're running on a, a smaller margin, the gross gross sales are, are higher, right? So that that gross margin dollar amount grows, and then your percentages grow, and then the market tanks again because <laughs> it's just a cycle, just yeah. a big cycle of peaks and valleys. It's, it's got to be one of the most cyclical industries I've ever it seen. It really is in such short short cycles, right. and and basically you're coming around to the oil and gas industry doing that, especially the shell players on. Out in Texas and Oklahoma, where I'm from, is that it was a huge bubble out there. They had all these great forecasts of the oil they're going to produce in year four, five, six, seven, eight. And they were just drilling all they could drill, and they drilled themselves out of business. And no help from OPEC, really, who was uh, trying to drive them out of business, too. So you had all these confluences, and then you get down to the actual four or five years, and they're not uh, not producing as much oil as they thought they would, and more gas. And there's places out in Texas and I think Oklahoma too, where you know your wellhead. You know you go to the nearest terminal, you ship it to the next nearest terminal through pipeline, or even truck, and um, and that gets passed along. That that initial place where uh, EMP company actually sells our oil is. Is, is basically in their natural gas as well. Natural gas is negative. You're paying people to take your natural gas away, mm-hmm. which is not flooded a good. It. Yeah, no, flooded yeah. with it. So it's not a good, not a good market to be in. But yeah, that was uh, that's kind of and what we're seeing for the rest of the year is is kind of that next phase in the cycle. Yeah, you know, we're we I guess we, we we are expecting a little bit of a uh, of a relief. Um, Coming up, you know, second half of 2020, uh, we're expecting capacity to shrink a little bit. Some people to leave the market, some of those drivers to get out. Uh, we're not seeing, you know, new orders and and used truck prices are both giving us some some indication that uh, capacity should tighten. Um, we're seeing uh, elevated o- operating ratios for trucking companies yes. at 100, sometimes above 100. Uh, increase in insurance costs. We did the nuclear verdicts paper. Our survey said that on average, uh, trucking companies are seeing a 20% increase year over year on premiums, which uh, whenever you're you're running 100 OR, is not 98 OR, 99 OR, it's not a good sign. So no, um, but you know should be should have brighter days ahead. The economy is still strong. Uh, mm-hmm. You know we're, China seems to be uh, the the. Trade talks with China seems to be improving. Um, the USMCA should should help out yeah. as well. More more yeah. more trade, uh, and especially if Brexit ends up happening, the, you know there, there's a good tie there between Boris Johnson and President Trump. So there could be okay. another deal there. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, the economy's strong, consumers good. Second half should be much better. It should be, and that's kind of our, our forecast right. is that yeah, the yeah, capacity is going to tighten a little bit. We're going to be more balanced market. We're certainly not 
probably not going to see 2018 unless there are critical events that were hit, and that's yeah. really what will drive. And that would you know that would honestly that. be. You know, those critical events, sadly, are usually natural uh, natural events, you know, hurricanes. There hurricane is one season. that's not that, that, that? we I, I forgot to mention, and that's the drug clearing house uh, database yes. yeah. that's going to make everyone who fails, every driver who fails a test, uh, that's going to be public information. All employers can go in and, and they have to search that uh, before they hire anyone. And basically, I think it was in 2018, the failure rate hit at 1%. So that means that in 2020, instead of a 25% random sampling, it's going to be 50%. So that database that, that started on January 6th with zero names in it, that is going to accelerate the building of that. Mm-hmm. And it's going to take uh, a lot of drivers that uh, in the past have been qualified and move them into the unqualified hiring bucket. And that's going to limit the supply of drivers out there, which should help uh, push rates up. Mm-hmm. For for carriers and brokers, and we've heard I've heard I've read at least a, a couple um, kind of wide ranging uh, expectations for that and what the actual capacity change could be. I think some people said by the end of this year, two or three percent mm-hmm. of drivers could be in there, but by the end of next year, when everything when it continues to populate, this is something that's going to grow as they as they drug test more. Uh, that it could be upwards of you know five, six, seven, eight percent. So it could be it could have a massive impact on the market. It definitely could, and you know I, I've been seeing that the initial numbers kind of put it on that pace. You know, if you can take the first two or three weeks results and, and right. forecast that out. So here in the next few months, we'll probably do a research project where we take the, the, the numbers and we do some kind of mathematical model mm-hmm. with our guys over in data science on the sonar side. And put an expectation out. Put an expectation out. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I think everything. we just came up with an idea that for a pretty research. Fun, actually. Yeah, I know yeah, it I does, like doesn't it? Yeah, do maybe right after the first quarter, yeah. right? So uh, so basically we, we see the March March. 30th numbers, yeah. uh, last day of the quarter, and we go from there. Or is it March 31st? I can never, uh, I can never remember. The 31st, yes. 30, 30, 30, so March 31st. And uh, we can just uh, forecast that on out. Call it done. We'll Call it do done. It. Call it uh, done. So let's move on. What, um, you know, you got a new show that that has been created yeah. in out of thin air about uh, five of, five minutes. Of, you guys come up with something. Uh, you, you go to the Caribbean, and we create a new I show. Come back and there's a new show. And you're like, what? What is this? I go, we did this in a day. We, we went from concept to title to a poster, <laughs> logo to social media, where we pumped it out on LinkedIn in a day. Freight wave speed, half a day, really, yeah. because we didn't really start until about eleven o'clock. Okay, but well, it's what is it? it when is it? And it, why should I watch? It, sure, it's Dooner and I, and it's all about freight sales. So if you're a freight broker out there. If you are anyway connected with freight sales, like a, a forwarder, expediter, if you work for a trucking company and you're a sales guy, it's all about freight sales. And it goes from this first episode, which debuts tomorrow, live on LinkedIn and YouTube and, and Twitter and, and available wherever podcasts are downloaded, iTunes, Spotify, and all the others. It is all about lead generation. Who owns lead generation? If you're a salesperson trying to do lead generation, how should you do it? What tools and resources out there for you? Uh, if you own a company and um, or you're a marketing person in a company, it's all about content marketing, what, what works, what doesn't. And uh, basically, we're going to have our special guest, the head of Sonar Sales, uh, here, Michael Caney, for a few minutes, talking about his his he used to be a, a freight broker and he was president of a freight brokerage uh, with Riverside Transportation, and he's going to tell us his philosophy about it all. And in future episodes, uh, we're going to have outside guests, a lot of out guy get uh, outside guests within the industry, outside of the industry, sales pros coming in. We don't have the answers, and that's the great thing about the show, I think. Do and I, we don't have the answers, but we have the questions, and we'll work through the, the answers live on the show. Plus, we're going to do call-ins. So any t- anyone who nice. wants to call in at any point, we jump off what we're talking about, and we pick up the call, answer the question. It might drive the discussion. It's all going to be kind of ad lib. Uh, going through just a, a very skeleton structure of what we're talking about, and we'll just we'll just talk. Dooner used to be a freight broker, didn't he? Was he? Uh, yeah, he was a, he was a freight broker. He, he did more of the the ocean side and expedited yeah, like, LTL. Okay. Uh, but yeah, we 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 trade we will swap war, war stories. I used yeah. to be a freight brokerage. We we've we've both knocked down a lot of doors. We've both cold called a lot of people, cold emailed a lot of people. 
and it's just kind of both of our questions about how could, how could we have done it better? What's the best structure? So we're going to bring in experts to to, to give us their, their insights and their, their tips and tricks. And so it's going to be a great learning process for, for, for anyone connected with freight sales, freight marketing, ownership, entre- entrepreneurship out there. Sounds good. So that's a uh, so recap it, oh, of the oh, Wednesday. It's going to be a weekly. Uh, it's a weekly, weekly, weekly live Wednesdays at one p.m. And then you know it's, it's available on Freightcast, iTunes, Spotify, YouTube, just where all other Freightcasts are available as well. That sounds exciting. Yeah. It's got to be what is that? What is that? Dooner's fifth or sixth podcast? I know he's, he's, he's just piling he's, it on. He is. He is. He's, he's a madman. All right, we got long short. We have long short. About ready. So. I am ready. All right. Let's so, close it off here with long short. <clears throat> uh, you know, we're, we're talking about the FANG stocks a little bit. This, it, the tech stocks have – seems like every year they keep saying this is the year that they that they pop and, and the S&P beats them and this is the year that tech companies are done and then somehow they, they keep turning along and they keep outperforming everything this year. Do so, the FANG stocks outperform the S&P? So they've had a great run in the second I, – I know in the second half of 2019, I don't know if you have uh, numbers for that um, – but they've had a fantastic run. I think such a fantastic run that I will go short and say that they do not outperform the, the market, the S&P, for, for 2020. And I think a lot of that, Google had disappointing numbers. I, Facebook didn't. Um, but, you know, Netflix, it, in this for Netflix, right? Yes, it is. And, and Netflix is going to have a challenging time. Yes, um, you know, Apple... You know, Apple's had a great run, so is that run over, or are they going to moderate? I'm not going to say that they're they're going to tank, but I don't think it's that the growth is going to be there. Yeah, you know, a couple of years ago, it was like all five of the fangs were, were, were top-notch. They were all still innovating, still doing new things. I think that there, a couple of them have fallen off that pace. I don't think Facebook is really uh, innovating in a way that they had been in, in years previous. Uh, you know, Libra seems to be a, a massive commercial disaster oh, yeah. uh, for them. I don't know what they were thinking there. Um <clears throat> and then you have Apple and and Alphabet. Alphabet, you know, their earnings hasn't been great. Um, you know, they're trying to get more into the home things. They're trying to innovate and get into the Google Homes and the, the security systems with Nest and it everything else. It's funny. We, we say, oh, Google's had disappointing results. Yeah, but I think up. most companies would, would, would kill yeah. for that growth. Yeah, and then that's just the, you know, the expectation that we've come with a company like that. That You know, you were expecting 25% which is, growth every year. Yeah, which is kind of why I'm, I'm going to go short because it's, just, it's all based on growth expectations, not the, the company themselves. It's that the... I, I think those growth they're they're not going to meet their growth expectations in 2020. Yeah, uh, I think I'd agree with you actually. I I think um, a- Apple may single handedly <laughs> keep, keep them up there, but uh, yeah, I, I do think that Facebook and Netflix especially um, probably have, have you know down years for, yes. uh, for, for, for the fan yes. stocks, which yes. means so everyone's coming 10, after 15%. Netflix. Yeah, I mean everybody they're, they're coming at their throats. I mean they have oh, yeah. you know I think Disney reports today, uh, so we'll so. see the first re- we'll see the first results uh, from Disney Plus, which would which should be fun. Um, might get some pin action on Netflix coming I, down I, on I, that. I think we'll I think you will see some pin action on that. Uh, okay, well yeah, yeah, so we're both short. We, we think the S&P short, yes. it grows outgrows the Fang this year. Uh, the next one is a, a topical thing, you know, Barstool Sports, the uh, the media conglomerate just got bought out, um, I think it was last week or the week before, by uh, a casino company, Penn National, I think is the name yeah, of it. Yeah, Penn National. Uh, at, a, at a massive valuation, $450 million, uh, I think it was $136 million for 33% of the company, and then they're going to buy up to 50% a controlling stake in a couple years. Uh, are you long or short Barstool Sports moving forward? You know, uh, great for those guys. It was great. I mean, to, to come up with a media company, and they've been around a, a little while. I, yeah. I, I because I really didn't realize they were. You know, I, I just heard of them maybe two or three years ago. I didn't realize they've been around for you know the overnight success. You mm-hmm. know, you just yeah, you, you don't just, hear about it. You until, only hear yeah. about it until they they hit it, right. and now they really hit it. But I, I think there is a room to to really carve out uh, a, a new sports sports medium. Uh, I, I think ESPN, Fox Sports, uh, though they're becoming old, aging actors in you know Disney with with ESPN, mm-hmm. right? In these conglomerates, and they can't really control their own destiny. That they have to uh, to to get their marching orders from from corporates, and I think that really limits limits companies. So I, I think there's a real 
there's real opportunity for kind of the next generation of really great sports programming to to come out. I, I say you're long. I'm, I'm long. Yeah. I got a couple. I got to first respond to you. Uh, I, yeah. d- I agree with you completely. I think that there is a new market for. Or there's a big market for a new uh, sports, you know, media conglomerate. I think ESPN is is sadly old news. I love ESPN, but it's mm-hmm. uh, especially Fox and any any of the other ones. I, it really is just ESPN for me. I think that they own that market uh, better than anyone. Um, so yes, I do think there's space. And then the second thing, I would think that Barcelona Sports could fill it. Um, but then I think I have a couple things. I yeah. have, I think that. Uh, I think they'll piss people off with some of their other content. They have a lot of just kind of they questionable, uh, you know, on the oh, edge yeah. stuff. But w- in our in our world today, everything moves so fast. You put out another headline, you know, w- we have people, you know, that can just keep creating news about themselves, and then everybody forgets about what they said mm-hmm. last week. That seems to be the the thing going on in this country. So I think they'll be fine. I think they can say whatever I they want, and they just I, about get away with it. I, I think so too. And and I, I haven't read too much about it, and I wish I had. Uh, is because whoever acquired Penn, Penn National, are they going to to use this to drive sports books? Yes, I think? that is that's where Barstool is. That's the reason Barstool's valuation's probably doubled in the last year because they've gotten into, into sports. sports book. Uh, yeah, this, this subs, uh, subscription um, sports betting where you, you know you get I'm, picks and whatnot. I mean, incro- incredibly long then, because if there's one thing that's never going to die, recession proof. Yeah. Sports gambling. <laughs> gambling you know, in general. Gambling yeah, in yeah. general is never going away. Yeah. I mean, you know, it's not going to be electrified. There's not going to be new energy sources. There's not going to be anything. People are always going to bet. And if you can uh, drive that through your casinos or online business mm-hmm. because I think Tennessee now yep, legal is online legal gambling online gambling. Soon. They've, they've already passed it. I don't know I, if it's I, legal I, yet. But I don't know either. Yeah. Um, but, but yeah, I mean, that's that's something that will never go away. Yeah, I, I agree with you on that. I I want to like Barstool. I just don't like the people that I – don't, I don't like the dudes that run it. But it's okay. Know, They're going to be successful. I, I don't, really watch I, I don't it, know so. whether um, – you know, it seems like an, a little bit of an odd match, like between a, a casino company and this media company. I don't know if the I don't know if Barstool knows enough about online gambling to really to, to help out Penn, and I definitely don't think Penn knows anything about media. But maybe together they can they can put their heads together yeah. uh, and and be successful. Yeah. I hope they are. I I think they've they've done an awesome thing. Like they've done it their way, oh, and yeah. I appreciate that that yeah. they've never sacrificed their own creativity and their own you know mantra for anyone else. So I I I'd appreciate that. So yeah, definitely. I wish them all the best. Very good. Very good. Well, that wraps it up for Kevin Hill and Andrew Cox here at the Freight Intel Group at Freight Waves, downtown Chattanooga. And thanks uh, thanks for everyone for, for watching, and especially, again, Carrier Direct for providing us with all this great uh, research. Uh, special thanks goes out to to Peter and Peter and Ryan. Oh. I hit the button. A little Peter, there. Peter, Ryan, and uh, Diane. So, Carrie Direct, thanks, and we'll see you all next week. Sleep apnea affects around 4% of the general population, but affects as much as 35% of truck drivers. Sleep apnea is one of more than 80 different sleep disorders and can be life threatening. For truck drivers, the most common form of sleep apnea is obstructive sleep apnea, or OSA. OSA impacts a driver's ability to obtain restorative sleep, and in turn, they are unable to remain vigilant while behind the wheel. Truckers who have OSA may be in bed for up to 10 hours, but actually get very little restorative sleep. Obstructive sleep apnea occurs when your throat muscles and mouth palate relax and collapse during sleep blocking the airway, resulting in an individual gasping for air. This combo of sleep fragmentation and interrupted breathing results in higher levels of drowsiness and increases a driver's risk for an accident by as much as 250% compared to a well-rested driver. Hey, good good afternoon, everybody. uh, As uh, Matt said, my name is Chris Torrance. I am Vice President of Client Services at 3G TMS. Uh, For those of you not familiar with us, we are a Tier 1 transportation management system. We sell to brokers, to 3PLs who do managed transportation, and to shippers. We really do the best with companies that are looking to combine multiple of those. So if you are a managed transportation service provider and a broker, we're a great platform for that. And really, we are a full 
complete TMS, handle everything up front from quoting all the way out to uh, the freight settlement pieces on both the buy and the sell piece. So I'm going to go ahead and log in. Um, as you can see, we are a web-based application like most companies today. We are a SaaS application, and we are not a LSP at all. Um, so we do not compete with any, any uh, brokers out there. We merely provide the software. So when I log in, I want to see a dashboard, a dashboard that's relevant for me. Every user can have their own dashboard. The dashboard can be made up of as many different sub-reports as they want. In this case, I'm merely looking at open loads by status and carrier, but I can also show things like profitability. Really, any sub-report that I want to include, I can have on this, um, this dashboard. So where I want to go today is I want to talk about three things, the importance of accurate rating, of efficiency, which we accomplish through process automation, and optimization. So first, I'm going to log in. Um, I'm already logged in, but I'm going to show you a view that an LSP's customer or broker's customer could see in the application. Now, I am using an internal view, so I'm going to see a few extra fields, but the view is the same for your customers. So I started entering a quote previously, and for us to enter a quote, it's pretty simple. You just need a couple pieces of data. You need an origin postal code, a destination postal code. You can have accessorials, and you need some kind of freight. So I've entered that, and I'm at the point where I want to get rates. So I'm going to go ahead and push get rates. And what we're doing is we're managing both the buy and the sell side of the rate. So your customers are going to see the sell rate, and behind it, you're also calculating the buy side. You want to know what you're going to pay. So we can see the charge side. We can see the cost. We can see the profit. Now, your customer won't see the cost and won't see the profit unless you want them to. They can also drill down, see the details. And in the case of LTL shipping, where they probably don't need any kind of involvement of your broker, they can go ahead and select it, assign it, enter shipping details, and move on through the process and tender it to the carrier. From here, they may want to go ahead and just um, do their tracking. So we do a lot of integration with, with uh, carriers. Go ahead and pull up a load. So we can show you all of the status events. Your customers can get to them pretty quickly by just clicking on a subgrid, see when the load was picked up, see when it was departed. And if you're using one of the services out there that provide the breadcrumb tracking, like Trimble Maps that we just saw, you can go ahead and link directly to that and see all the details of that load. So from here, I want to jump and show a little bit more what you would do internally using the system to provide capacity to a, to, uh, for your loads. So we have something we call the load management workspace. And like most of our application, we can configure it quite extensively. In this case, I have four different tabs I want to work with. I have my loads that I'm, ex that I'm working on execution. You can see the color is very different on many of them. You can figure what the colors mean. You can configure when the colors change. I have another uh, tab that shows me loads that are delayed. These are maybe things I want to follow up on immediately. I have my activity required loads. These are things I'm expecting activity to happen over the next time period that I've defined that I need to take action on. And finally, I have a special tab that, I've, that I'm using for me called Demo. I'm going to go ahead and select one of these loads. And this load has already been assigned to a carrier. And just like before, we can go ahead and get rates and understand what our different options are, including all the accessorials associated with them. Pick the right one. If you do not have contracts, we have many other options. We can get a rate index from DAT. We could call out, for example, a DAT rate view. Um, we could pull up a load cost history and see what you've paid on this lane in the past. So that's what I'm going to do right now. I'm going to go ahead and pull up my load cost history. And I can see in the past I've used Swift twice and Timely once. And I can pull up all the details associated with those and choose what I want to do. So these buttons are, also, are very contact sensitive. I'm going to go ahead and tender the load to Swift. All right, and as soon as I do that, the screen changes because it knows now that I can no longer tender it. Right? I have to move on to the next logical step. 
In this case, if they decline the tender, we're going to go ahead and decline it. They may, they may come in on our carrier portal. They may send in EDI. Um, in this case, we're going to go ahead, take in that decline information, the application is saying, what should I do next? And we have now moved it on to the second carrier, Timely. We're going to pay a little bit more, but we do have capacity. So that's another great example of, of the system being efficient for you, automating processes, moving on to different carriers as needed. The final thing I want to show you is our optimization capability. So managed transportation companies want to take as many orders as they can, combine them, and be as efficient as possible. With just a few clicks, you can select a number of orders, you can run planning on them, and we will combine those as best we can and come out and show you where the savings are. So I have multiple ways I've saved money. I've done a very complex solution here, um, mapping or combining about five or six different orders, doing a, a multi-stop line haul, and then uh, pull drops out of it. And I've also done multiple other multi-stops <coughs> uh, along the way. So optimization is definitely where our customers go to to save a lot of money in the future. And I'm just about out of time, so feel free to come. Sleep apnea affects around 4% of the general population, but affects as much as 35% of truck drivers. Sleep apnea is one of more than 80 different sleep disorders and